Hi, this is Ian Anderson and this is Martin Barr from Jethro Tull. And uh, we're going to be talking to you today about some of the reminiscences and high and abysmally low and indeed embarrassing points in our 25-year, not quite illustrious career. And uh, Martin and I are both a little bit nervous about having to talk to you about this because uh, we feel on the spot, so to speak, wouldn't you say, Mark? It's uh, very difficult, but uh, I'm sure we'll come up with some jolly interesting stories and try and keep the embarrassing bits to a minimum. Or a maximum, if I have my way. Okay. However, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to start off without the aid of Martin, because back in 68, when Jethro Tull really first formed, Martin was uh, still a saxophone player in a soul group somewhere in the south of England, and uh, so we'll manage without him for the next uh, minute or two. We actually formed out of a band called the John Evan Band that uh, was a sort of school band. And uh, when that disintegrated really towards the end of 67, I met up with Clive Bunker and uh, Mick Abrahams uh, in a town called Luton in the south of England. And we formed a group that was really basically a blues band. And we honoured some of the final gigs of the John Evan Band playing around the blues clubs in the south of England in early 68. And by, I believe, late February 68, we had actually got our name Jethro Tull and had become a resident group at the famous Marquee Club. And uh, indeed, we had started to write a few songs as well as playing standard blues things. So that by summer of 68, we were in a position to go out and do what no record company would do on our behalf, that is, pay for the recording sessions to make our first LP, which we did without a producer and uh, with the aid only of a trusty engineer in a four-track recording studio, which was very cheap, uh, somewhere in Chelsea in London. And we made an album called This Was, uh, a very um, interesting name, an interesting album cover, as we were depicted as looking like old men I suppose it was with some view that if we ever did survive beyond a few years, we might look up back upon ourselves as uh, as a bunch of uh, uh, guys, you know, making what was conspicuously their first album, and not necessarily the kind of music we would go on to play, but at least the kind of uh, interesting and uh, early starting point for a for a longer career. So we called it "This Was," and indeed, looking back on it, it certainly was and rarely is, except in the sense that we do, strangely after all these years, still play a few songs from that album today. But then Martin came along when Mick Abrahams departed at the end of 68. Martin came for an audition for the replacement guitarist job and uh, nervously turned up to say hi to the rest of us and to try to plug in his electric guitar. What say, yeah. Martin? Uh, it was indeed a, a nerve-wracking experience in as much that uh, it, was, it was a room full of guitar players, literally the, the, a, a fairly small room in Soho in London, uh, with chairs all, all the way around the walls, completely full of people holding guitars, waiting for their turn to play. Uh, however, after much sort of embarrassment and uh, feeding back guitars and squeaking and squawking, uh, we sort of it's uh, all sort of came together but uh, it was it was very nerve-wracking to to do that hmm. i think uh, that auditions these days are more humane that's right yeah <laughs> that's right we administer a painless uh, <laughs> uh, yes yeah, right the painkiller for the people who aren't wanted mm. and they're shuttled out on stretchers and put back in their little group yeah. vans and sent back whence they came um, anyway, that was really pretty much 68. I do remember we had s Christmas dinner, which, if I remember right, was a beef curry at the, what was it called, that, that weird kebab house place down in Kentish Town? The Forum oh, Cafe. the Forum Cafe. Jeffrey Cathy. Hammond yeah. used to go when he was yep. at art school. That's right. Yes, we had Christmas mm. dinner at, or Christmas yeah. lunch at the Forum Cafe. Mm. Well, there were strange rehearsals. They're, they're in London. In, in some strange basement, again in Soho, but a different basement. Mm. Um, and it was, there was nobody in London. It was completely deserted, was except a, for us rehearsing every day. It was a bleak, <laughs> bleak midwinter. <laughs> and let's get off that bleak midwinter, mm. get away from the wretched, wretched cold 1968, which is almost as cold as 67, the record year of mm. cold, and uh, and look towards the, the balmier and more exciting, indeed the more... Uh, 
romantic and uh, eventful period of 1969. 1969, with Jethro Tull rehearsing frantically to integrate new boy Martin Barr into the band um, in, in time to fulfill, indeed to honour, some uh, club dates and things that we already had coming up. What was it like, Martin, being groomed for stardom and having to learn not only the things that that uh, dear old Mick had played, but also having to work on brand new material? It was absolutely terrifying and uh, I, was, I was a bag of nerves and I think it's, it's, it's the day I started smoking menthol cigarettes it was probably in that basement in Soho but but luckily it didn't last maybe 10 years but uh, it, it was and, and, and the first after we played in England those few dates we went to Europe and we played with Jimi Hendrix ah oh, yes in which, Scandinavia yeah, which for a guitar player is a fairly scary thing to have to do but uh, it, it was good fun mm, that's right and then we went off on our uh, first First North American tour, where we, we got uh, shipped into New York to meet up with our sort of rather mafioso-like American agent <laughs> and manager, and um, we were, uh, I think we were eight weeks, or no, 13 weeks on that first American tour, during which I think we played a total of about 10 gigs. Yeah. Most of the time we just sat mm. doubling up in some very sleazoid hotels and uh, only going out, risking the, the 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 couple of blocks run down to the nearest the nearest Smiley's, Smiley's delicatessen for the roast beef sandwiches. But we, we learn everything there is to know about American sandwiches because we probably had uh, a different one each day and and went through the whole menu. Yeah, we were into milkshakes as well. Then I seem to remember mm. those very thick malted mm. milkshakes were high mm. on the, the list of priorities. Mm. But we did actually. I remember we were in Boston. We were playing. <laughs> We well, were staying in a Holiday Inn, as I, I recall, and I think Pentangle, that English That's sort right. of folky band, were also staying there. But I remember it, if only for being uh, the period that we, or th that I was sent off to a hotel room to write a single for England. That was when um, I wrote the song Living in the Past, which I think we actually recorded in a cheap studio in New York, an mm. eight-track studio in New York. And Run by we, Italians. Was it? <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> well, I love Funny Italians. that, isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, another coincidence. What a coincidence. Thank you for mentioning that, Martin. Thanks mm -hmm. for sharing that with us. Pleasure. And, um, and Living in the Past was then completed at the end of the tour. I think I added the vocals and we mixed mm -hmm. it in a studio, if I'm not mistaken, in San Francisco. And it was then dutifully shipped back to England to be released to uh, keep the pot if not boiling, at least simmering while we were away on uh, on uh, on our foreign tour of duty. But what do you remember about that American tour? I mean, did we write any other songs for, for what was th going to be the next album? I guess Benefit? Um, I, I, I don't think so. But because, uh, I, I just remember being sort of s sat in a hotel for hours on end. And, and we, we, I think we only played the weekend, sort of Saturday night, Sunday night. And then the rest of the week we just hung yeah. around. Yeah, it was very little benefit. We hadn't written Stand Up no, at that point, had we? I think we were playing some of that music on stage. Just Stand Up came out in '69. I think when we were on our second tour, that's so we right. were recording right. after the first <clears throat> tour. Yeah. Things like Nothing yeah. Is Easy and mm -hmm. For a Thousand Mothers and all that stuff that was. Mm. Uh, that's a pretty good album looking mm. back on it. I remember because mm. I'd started to play. In, you know, apart from playing the flute and harmonica, I think I'd picked up the balalaika and the mandolin again by then, and, uh, and then strummed a bit of acoustic guitar as well. Um, that's a pretty good album, looking back mm. on it, and indeed we still play some of those songs even today. You like the stand-up album, Martin? I do. It you has I'm very fun memories. Yes, I'm some, jumping in as some, quick as some, I can. Some little engineer <laughs> can think, oh, for music, yes. we can slip one of those songs you mm. just mentioned in at that point. Anyway, sorry well, to interrupt. Me well, shall, you. shall I tell them about the mic swinging? Tell them about the mic swinging. In front swinging. of the cabinet, is that Absolutely. A, what a great well, story. Well, that was uh, the sound that people have probably been searching for ever since. Uh, and it was on New Day yesterday where searching for that slightly different sound we, we invented the guitar leslie which was me playing through a high what four by twelve cabinet and you standing in front with a microphone on its attached to its cable swinging it yeah i was that's right i was swinging them mm. swinging the microphone around the microphone i'm swinging the microphone around the the cabinet 
<laughs> one cabinet or two cabinets? Just the one. I'm not swinging something <laughs> around something else. I'm trying to think, why didn't we just use a Leslie cabinet? Uh, well, I don't Maybe know. It's probably too easy. easy. And too mm. expensive. <laughs> yeah, I know I was swinging something around something else. <clears> or was I swinging it around you? I think you were swinging it in a circle in front of the speaker. <laughs> Whatever, it gave us that peculiar sort of phasing, flanging yeah. sort of sound. That, now you can go and spend $200 yeah. and buy a piece of equipment that does exactly the same thing. But uh, back then we had to resort to swinging something round something else and hoping for the best. But it made an interesting noise, that's for sure. And um, we did three tours, didn't we, in 69 in the USA. And I think it was... I remember sitting in... I think it was Lowe's Midtown Manhattan Hotel when Joe Cocker, who was on tour at the same time, came into the to breakfast one morning and said, uh, "Oh, congratulations! I've just, you know, just heard, you know, on a phone call to England that your album has gone to number one in the English charts." <laughs> and I remember that. I remember I was having scrambled <laughs> eggs and bacon, and whole wheat toast, and orange juice, and some yeah. coffee. What were you eating? Uh, I was probably on a diet. Uh, cheese. Cheese sandwich. Good bet, yeah, good bet. Yeah. And it, it also, on the West Coast, we met the MC5. Oh, we so we did. Yeah, now, weren't they the were original the, punk group. That's oh, right. They wonderful. were the precursor of everything that yeah. punk was some, you know, ten years yeah. later. The MC... They were actually... I mean, they were evil guys, weren't they? I mean, they were... They actually... I mean, the famous thing, I think, was the bass player took, and forgive my language, took a dump mm -hmm. live on stage every night. So the rumour was. And they loathed us, or anybody like us, and um, but in fact, off stage, um, they were okay. It was just a bit of the sort of uh, bit showbiz, wasn't it? The yeah, I think so. Anarchic well, behaviour. Well, they messed us a few years later and, and, and apologised, and they were apologised to that's you. Right, they were real pussy cats. Yeah, yeah. It's funny that we, it? we tamed them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. They had a long, long and illustrious career. You know, like many of the groups of that era that we we still, you know, virtually household names today, you know, like Grand Funk Railroad. <laughs> <laughs> there were all these bands yeah, we played cruel, with. I mean, weren't there some amazing <clears throat> bands? And yeah. At the time, you thought, well, they were, they were much better than us and much more interesting mm -hmm. than us. We thought yeah. we wish we could be like them. and then, But they didn't um, They didn't last too long. It, it, was, it was good fun playing at the Fillmore in New York because I think we had to do two shows, didn't we? We did a sort of a regular evening show, and we went next door to the Jewish deli and ate, and then went back in and did the late show. Mm. There was oh, always three the bands I went back to the Italian. <laughs> well, I, I was under contract, Martin. I had to eat their sandwiches. 1970. I remember standing outside the Whiskey, was that the name of that weird club in LA? Yes. Where people used to go. Mm -hmm. Standing outside the Whiskey, Whiskey a go go or something is it called? So. With uh, a very large, a very very cheerful, very large and slightly um, dangerous looking guy, an, an almost mountainous physique. Who am I talking about? Oh, it in, must be Leslie West. In, am we, I right? And we had we had been to see them do a showcase gig, and um, oh, and they were being touted as the sort of American version of Cream. Yes. And a few months later, I think they were on the road with us. If mm. not that year, then the year after, certainly they were out touring with us. And no. uh, when did we tour with Led Zeppelin? Was that 1970? Well, may well have been. 1970 <laughs> could have been Zeppelin, and yeah, that's right. Yes, we, they, we went on their tour as a support act. Yeah. We played 35 minutes, didn't we? And mm. that was uh, that was pretty easy. And then they had mm. to go on and do the real work. Mm. Yeah. Um, and some <laughs> nights they were terrific, and some nights they weren't so terrific. I mean, we were terrible every night, but we were consistent. We were, we were consistent, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we, we we did pretty well that tour. I think it got us across an awful lot of people that, yeah. uh, without Zeppelin's uh, uh, mm. friendly um, um, taking on of our services, we wouldn't have managed to play so many people so early on in our uh, American uh, touring activities. And uh, was that also the year, or was it before that? Maybe it was that year when we first went to Germany, and, and poor old Fritz Rau, the promoter in Germany, had the indignity of uh, um, of having the the whole place smashed up by overly ardent fans. They were eventful years for mob violence and outrageous happenings, which we were all entirely innocent of. Mm, that was um, where was that in Germany? It was. Uh, it was in Frankfurt. Frankfurt. The last yes. old building. What a place for a rock concert. Mm. However. 
69 <clears throat> outside the whiskey and we were i think probably at that time i would have been writing some of the songs that were um on the benefit album and uh benefit was one of those uh we were sort of in a rippy period weren't we, we were doing things like to cry you a song that was the, the yeah. album of the riff you played electric guitar on quite a few tracks i think in the studio that's right on mm -hmm. and teacher on that. teacher was another one that mm -hmm. uh, i think i played a bit of electric yeah. guitar on and, that uh, and on the on the u.s album version and we introduced uh, john came in and played hammond ah yes a few john, tracks, evan john, from the john evan band mm -hmm. returned from his lonely room next door to my bed sitter where he was a he was a a, a pharmacy student and uh, actually he could have he should have really joined the grateful dead shouldn't he with his knowledge of uh, pharmacological um, <laughs> powders anyway but he didn't he joined he joined us as keyboard player and left the world of drugs behind although he did take up serious drink in later life and uh, um this luckily still with it. we saw john the other week in fact totally reformed. jumping a, mm. jumping ahead wearing a suit spectacles and running a very respectable business. Yeah. yes mm -hmm. What a sad end. <laughs> to be that respectable. <laughs> we might come and join us again one day. Mm. So John joined playing proper piano and Hammond <coughs> organ <coughs> on the Benefit album and did those tours with us and became a full-time member of the group. And, uh, of course, Glenn Cornick and Clyde <coughs> Bunker were still with us at that time. And uh, 1970, if I remember, the last tour of that year marked the departure of Glenn Cornick. Um, from the band to form his own group wild turkey and we carried on into yet another year going heading up towards the new the basing street studios owned by island records to record our uh, our uh, fourth and moderately important album as yet untitled but which became the album aqualung more of that in a moment Another horrifically cold winter, as I remember it, Martin. I see, I'm sure we're recording again in the winter. We all seem to be making Yes, records. yeah, we seem to do it either side of Christmas, didn't we? It was a... On the grounds that nobody ever booked you to do tours at Christmas, That's so it was the only time you had to go yeah. to the studio. And it kept you away from home. <laughs> and <laughs> you had dinners. a white MG then, didn't you? I did, but it's, uh, I probably wasn't driving it very often if it was snowing. Yeah, I did. I remember yeah. you also were one of the first uh, members of the group to take... Uh, um, take up the world of bicycling. I, I, did, I remember didn't you, I, yes. you bought an outrageously yes. expensive bicycle, mm. which you then set off to to have a little exercise riding around Hyde Park. Oh, and I remember did. you telling me that one day you arrived late and you said, "Well, one pedal came off <laughs> <and I was laughs> going around Marble Arch <laughs> roundabout." Which yeah. is a, a sight all of us would have loved to have seen was you know, the, the one-pedalled bicyclist mm. lurching his way around <laughs> through six lanes of mad traffic. Luckily, I had a toe clip on the other pedal. <laughs> so it was still attached, what waving aimlessly yeah. in the air off of one side. Yeah, but get, sort of always veering to the left. Mm. Which was kind of in the when you're heading right mm. around Marble Arch, mm. round about, yeah, you changed lanes then a few times. Mm. Well, in, in those days, cyclists weren't looked upon kindly, they're just sort of a nuisance, so it, it didn't last very long. Mm. I think uh, they were very rare being on the roads, and it was very apparent that I didn't belong on them. Mm. No, quite. I don't so know, we, back anyway, to the MG. We scraped you off the wheels of a London mm. cab just in time to go. Da, 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 da. Ah, that was the year of that. It was indeed. It was mm. also the year of da 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 dum 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 <coughs> chuk chuk mm -hmm. chuk chuk which was momentous, if only for the fact that we tried to record in the studio and miserably failed. I think on several attempts, and I went. I finally resorted to going out and playing bass drum and hi hat for four and a half minutes. It was a difficult a album. Track. It was a difficult yeah, album. Yeah. And, uh, and then everybody, then John did his kind of intro piano bit, and then mm -hmm. we went and overdubbed the other instruments to, mm -hmm. and Clive went out and played tom-toms and cymbals <laughs> on top of my embryonic drum part. But we, I mean, it's funny looking back on it, that it was one of the most um, artificially put together songs I think we ever did. Yeah, and the, I think when we were recording Aqualung, Led Zeppelin were in the studio below us. Mm. And I remember struggling equally with whatever their album was. Probably. I remember they, they, we were both yeah. in there. I, mean, I remember that it was like 
all their tales of woe, mm -hmm. you know, were pretty much equal to ours in terms of, you know, just things not going very well and not getting the sound we were after. And mm -hmm. it was all a bit sort of um, traumatic, wasn't it? That, was, that seemed to be our, the problem of going in a new studio that was uh, perhaps not quite... Uh, all the bugs had not been ironed out. Mm -hmm. as I remember, uh, uh, while, we're doing the, while I was playing the solo in Aqualung was when Jimmy Page decided to come into the control room and say hello. And, and I remember being in the studio trying to do the solo, in fact, doing the solo, and he was waving through the window. I thought, well, should I wave back or should I sort of bravely battle through the solo? And, and I did. But, but that was just that's the solo of the solo. <laughs> that's right, yeah. That's <laughs> Probably, what, that's what, it's on like, the record. That little silent <laughs> bit in the middle, yeah. But uh, yeah. that was the solo but that if, was I mean, on the record. If, if anybody who has the, if particularly you have the CD copy of Aqualung, if uh, any of you have that, then it is worth listening because uh, now that digital sound is with us and the original uh, uh, remastered um, original mix is available on the two CD version of, uh, of the um, Aqualung uh, thing from the, whatever this two CD Best of Jethro Tell album is coming out this year. Um, those of you with a keen ear and expensive equipment, if you listen in the, roughly in the middle of Martin's guitar solo, in Aqualung, if you listen very, very carefully, you can just, just hear Jimmy Page waving. I think he wants a royalty. Oh, well, end of 1971, another few tours of North America and a few European tours and what have you, and Aqualung, I think, had done pretty well. We found ourselves down at the, the basement studios belonging to the Rolling Stones in Bermondsey, in uh, sort of uh, East London, where we went in to record or to rehearse first of all the um the album that was to become thick as a brick and i remember in a, a in an act of extreme bluffing on a daily basis coming in saying okay right next piece of music we have today to add on to the rest of the stuff as we built it up you know is um is such and such and i'd only written it that morning because i kept you know literally going back after we'd rehearse something at night and then sort of feverishly writing the next piece that I would come in the next day and pretend that it was all part of some master plan, some grand scheme, whereas in fact, of course, I was only making it up as I went along. But you didn't know that, did I, you, Martin? I, no, I do now. It's amazing, I never realised. Yeah, mm. funny that, isn't yeah. it? I got away with it till now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was also the uh, the year of the pranks. So I always remember, remember being down, uh, it was a basement again, and we seemed to end up in basements. Uh, and often switching out the lights and sort of getting up to all sort of peculiar things. Well, well not really peculiar, not, not that but uh, peculiar, no. things like, I hasten to add, setting my newspaper on fire was one. Oh, that was a, Jolly that was a Jake. very popular one. That, that was, one, yes. When, whilst reading the paper, someone would yeah. slip up, uh, you know, in, in front of you with a with a match and set the newspaper on fire. Mm -hmm. There was always that sort of wonderful moment where there was a sort of slight smell of smoke mm -hmm. and then so the whole thing went mm -hmm. up in considerably mm -hmm. large mm -hmm. sheets of flame. Uh -huh. Another good one was when uh, I was attempting to play violin on uh, on some part of Thick as a Brick mm -hmm. in a jig section. I had this violin down there and, 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 and it was a dreadful squawking awful noise but you've got to start somewhere. Um, you also have to finish somewhere as well, which I did shortly afterwards. But during the brief period that I was playing violin, um, Barry Byler, who'd found another violin bow somewhere with the strings, the, the actual strings of the bow cut completely, uh, placed the, the cut stringed bow next to my violin. So that when I came to play the bit, it looked like, you know, someone had cut my bow. And I went absolutely bananas. I mean, went completely hairless because I thought, as indeed both of us have now gone, but as, a, as an, an, an early example of uh, premature hair loss, I mean, I just, I couldn't believe that anybody had done this. And then Barry was sniggering in the corner and I said, I can't believe you really did that, Barry. What a terrible, horrible thing to do. Whereupon, of course, my, my uncut own bow was produced and... Uh, that was a very jolly jade, yes, that it was, was very yes, funny. did get even, so angry. Even I had to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And uh, my other fond or unfond memory of, of those rehearsals, the, the calf down the road, which was probably called Rose's calf. 
They usually were. Was it because it was um, from Eric Brooks's song, Eric Brooks the Roadie, his finger in the rose? Ah, no, that's Rosie Lee. Rose, is it? Oh, of course it is, yeah. For a cup of tea. Yeah. However, I think this was Rosie's Calf, where we used to go and have hmm. sort of fried everything, bacon, sausage, steak and kidney pie. Oh, don't, Martin. Two. No. <laughs> I know. Because we're not allowed that I'd now, love that. We? I really would. Yeah. Just one day back at Rosie's Cafe. But... And and uh, the the lady who cooked it had a moustache and bits of beard and moles and sort of a truck driver stuff. It was a kind of disgusting place. But, however, that's where we were nourished. Hmm. For our musical things. <laughs> yeah, there were things as well. But I mean, we battled through all that rehearsal and then went off to, to record. I think it actually took us less time to record Thick as a Brick than it did to rehearse it. And in fact, it took us even longer to do the album cover of Thick as a Brick and longer to actually write and edit and put together the whole complicated 16-page uh, newspaper, whatever it was. Um, than it did to record the album. It was one of the advantages, wasn't it, of, of doing meaningful rehearsals and getting the thing into shape as a performance piece of music, so that when you went into the studio, I mean, you really just got on with the job, you know, mm. which is quite uh, quite a good way to work. So the, the, the momentum of being in the studio, I mean, you really just played. You didn't spend aim, aimless hours trying different arrangements or fiddling about, because you got that out of the way a couple of weeks before down mm. at... Uh, down at the Stones rehearsal room and, and Rosie's. Good good for us, but as I remember, not good for Robin Black. A lot of editors. Who I think uh, developed his nervous twitch mm. during that album. Yeah. I think we only used a couple of reels of tape because we just dropped in or edited on the next piece of music. Mm. We did, did it all uh, in order. And I remember all of side two of Thick as a Brick, which we finished <laughs> mixing, and it was a continuous piece of music. It was an enormous task involved you know, a huge amount of tracks would change, you know, every few bars, you know, what was a, a bass guitar would suddenly become a, a violin with half a bow or a Hammond organ or something. It was just totally all over the place, very difficult to mix. And unfortunately, the master machine that was uh, that we were mixing onto had to fault. And uh, from beginning to end of side two, the pitch of the tune changed by a quarter tone. Everything was completely out of tune with concert pitch at the end of side two, and we had to go back and remix the entire oh. thing again on a different machine. So that that was a bit of a bit of a spoiler. However, it came out and it did moderately well, didn't it? Thick as a brick. It was uh, everybody's uh, favourite album that year, and uh, we had some good good shows that we did around that period of time and visited all sorts of places uh, that we hadn't been before, including Japan, where our then manager Terry Ellis had to. Uh, um, hold up giant cardboard signs with the the gags with the jokey bits written on in Japanese characters, so the audience would get it. But of course they didn't. <laughs> they just they totally stared, ignored him. Stared, stared at us in stony silence, thinking, "Who are these people? Yeah. What are they doing yeah. here with these strange clothes mm. and playing very very complicated, and very strange music?" I and, remember, and we never went back since. We were on a bullet train, and and it pulled into some station somewhere in Japan. And there's hundreds of these little girls waiting on the platform of the station. And we just thought, wonderful that they're here to meet us. We got off the train and they immediately ran completely past us to surround this Japanese group that was in the sort of coach down the way. Yeah, and there was another band who were on who actually I, were on tour at the same time as us in Japan. They were called the... Um, they were sort of country and western kind of band. Do you remember them? The... Uh, Oh, the name the name should be there, but it's not. Whoever they were, they were a bunch of old, balding kind of guys, you know, that had been around for years and years playing some, you know, real kind of dreadful, old-fashioned kind of music. And they were unknown everywhere, except in Japan, where they were the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just, like, huge in Japan. And that is one of the lingering memories I have of Japan, which is exactly why I'm going back to Japan shortly to try and rekindle our, uh, as, as it remained, an embryonic career. Because I figure that now that we are incredibly old and balding and play really old-fashioned music, that there's now a little bit of a chance for us, Martin, in Japan. Mm -hmm. Next time on the bullet train, those girls are going to be waiting for us. 
Boy, <laughs> boy, do we have a sad story to tell them. Will they be our age, though? <laughs> <laughs> the same one. Yeah, I didn't think of that, did I? No, I knew there was a terrible flaw to this plan. But the other thing in Japan, and it was, we, we, I don't know if you ever remember trying to get rid of Jeffrey's boots, his sort of day glow lime green boots that he decided to throw out, and um, the Japanese being very efficient, and how they ever realised that they belonged to Jeffrey, I don't know, but he'd leave them outside his room, he'd throw them away in the streets, but every morning, they would appear outside his door. They They're brought probably them still back. there. Goodness they brought me. them back. Yeah. Isn't that nice of them? Mm. Mm. You'd never get rid of them. Well, Funny that. It is. You'd probably find them outside I, your room. You know, I'd never heard that story before, Martin. That's yeah. a very, very interesting it one. It is. Mm. Yes. Well, I'm, Thank you. To, I'm going to try and throw away some things when I go to Japan and see if they come back to me. <laughs> and uh, I'll let you know how I get on. Well, the end of 72, beginning of 73, found us in Switzerland for reasons that I can't quite remember, busy writing and rehearsing. In fact, I remember being alone in a sort of uh, rented apartment in Switzerland, courtesy of our good friend Claude Nobbs, um, who was a Swiss promoter, um, who uh, had found me an apartment, actually, in the, in the building belonging to his father. And uh, I was there alone, writing the music that was to become a passion play. Um, but... I remember struggling to do this stuff, just me and my first single 016 New Yorker Martin guitar, and uh, my only company was a, a tape of Villa Lobos, and um, I remember one of the opening parts to the album that we then attempted to make a few weeks later actually began with a sort of guitar piece, which is definitely owes something to my... Uh, my uh, uh, companion cassette, since that was all I had to listen to at the time. But then you all came in from England or whatever, and we, we did our rehearsals down in some another basement, uh, stone we're, building or whatever. We, yeah, we'd, we'd made it to the ground floor by now. I think oh, we'd really? sort of been promoted to up, up yeah. to the ground floor. It still had no windows, but hmm. uh, and I, I think it was called the Brick Factory, which was sort of down. On the lake shore. Oh right. At, just outside of Montreux. Yeah. And sort of nothing in it. It was just a, a bare building, and we had all our gear inside, and that was it. Right. And then we set off to the Chateau d'Auville near Paris, where lots of famous people like Elton John and Cat Stevens and people had you know recorded very successful albums there, and it was a sort of famous residential studio people were were using. But we found it a complete nightmare. I mean, the equipment was extremely dodgy. All the Everything was going wrong technically every day, and we were really, really struggling to make this album. And I think we got three sides out of a four-sided double album recorded with great difficulty, and then finally became so disenchanted with it, we just all jumped on the plane, went back to England, scrapped, it, scrapped the whole thing, and started again. And the, the, the other problem was the food where it was sort of another ghastly woman, big fat woman who cooked cook for everybody. She'd sort of serve up these strange-looking birds that were obviously sparrows. Oh, Madame Rose. Mean? This is Madame Rose. Yes, yeah. yes, you yeah. learned to speak French. And uh, several of us were fairly ill, in including me and Barry. Yeah, well, you would and do, I mean, when you eat sparrows, I mean... It's not the, you know, the beaks especially, sort of, right. down for your digestion, but I, I remember many a take where in the middle of some complex piece of music, either I or Barry would just suddenly drop drumsticks and guitars and run out to the, uh, the nearest bathroom. And drop everything. And dr <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes, I, that's, we, did, mm. we did all suffer from dodgy tums. Mm. Um, that's quite true. And in fact, we'd all, I think that may have been uh, a leftover from uh, the kind of problems that we all seem to have with our tums I think at the time when we were rehearsing earlier than that, I seem to remember we were all ill when we came back via... We flew back from America via Bombay, that was it, overnight, and uh, those of us, most of us came back via Bombay. Some people had to get their oboes fixed, <laughs> as I recall, but most of us came back from Bombay and um, and um, stopped off for one night in Bombay and, and were all extremely ill as a result. And I think we had these sort of lingering... Um, sort of repeats of uh, some awful illness that went on for months to come. We were still 
every every couple of weeks or so you'd come down with this sort of recurring illness and uh, I think that lingered on in all the way through those sessions so yes health technical problems um, the, the, the distance from the recording studio to the nearest lavatory I mean all of these things played a part in it not being a very successful recording time and uh, until now those tapes were presumed scrapped shredded and lost and lo and behold Martin I actually found those tapes I don't know where we found them but uh, uh, two, I knew we had one, but I found another two, and I'm just almost, as we speak, finished mixing uh, another two sides of that uh, unreleased Chateau Disaster tape, which will be uh, released in uh, in Jethro Tull's other box set, close to uh, Christmas of 1993. And uh, it doesn't actually sound too bad. It's very 70s, but it's quite. Uh, it does sound a lot better than I remember it. Although I have to say that perhaps with modern equipment and the uh, the expertise developed over the years, you know, it sounds a lot better now than it did last time I heard it back in 1972 or three or whenever it was when we uh, last played those tapes uh, in the lonely chateau and decided to consign them to the bin. However, we went on to record mm -hmm. Passion Play, and that was a, a, an astounding success, as you will probably recall. I mean, it, everybody just loved that record, Martin. I mean, what are your recollections? Well, I, I, I think that uh, out of all the records we've made, more people talk about Passion Play but than, a, than a lot of albums. It's, it's a memorable album, and I think it's an important album. Um, I, th I think the... the the, the difficult thing was going back to England, having scrapped a whole album, sort of months and months of work, and the sort of terrible thing, I mean, for you, more than anybody else, of having to then completely start again, mm. uh, and rewrite, re-record, re-learn, re-rehearse, but, but uh, I, I think it was a, a good album, and the, the, the tour, and the sort of theatrics that came with the tour, were quite a memorable period. Yeah, I think for me the problem with it, if there was a problem, is that the, the humour that was there on Thick as a Brick was not there on Passion Play. I think because a lot of the humour had been knocked out of this after a year of being away and, and you know, both touring, living in Switzerland, rehearsing, then recording in France, and then finally coming back to England and starting all over again to rehearse and record virtually all new material. I mean, that kind of took a lot of the humour out of it. I think for me, looking back on it, that's the thing that's missing from Passion Play. It's, just, it's a little yeah. bit too deadpan. It doesn't have that kind of uh, slightly irreverent and humorous kind of, uh, um, you know, kind of little interludes or moments that, that just make that light relief that would make it more listenable. However, in some ways, maybe the parallel, the Stones had an album out, um, didn't they, once, that was a, a sort of universal... Uh, stiff at the time and subsequently I think it's become, you know, people have begun to appreciate it more. It's when they were going through their sort of uh, hippie period I think probably about 68 mm -hmm. trying to match up to the, the Sergeant Pepper hit and they came up with yeah. this sort of hippie album what was that one called? The uh, Satanic, Satanic, Satanic Majesties, yeah. that's right which yeah. had songs that we all sort of hated back mm -hmm. then but I mean some of them are actually yeah. okay. I mean it's like one of those things it's just not really appreciated at the time it's a little bit too contrived a little bit too heavy-handed but looking back on it with the passing of the years you can be a little bit more generous in the way that you you view it and the way you listen to it and I, I guess that's how I feel about passion play the two-thirds of it is actually okay it's just it's heavy going heavy going and I think heavy going to play which is why we very rarely play any bits of it and why we had to wear rabbit suits and why we had to wear rabbit suits to Maybe that's when it all went wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I you should have told me when I said, Martin, put on the rabbit suit, you should have said, Ian, this is going to be sadly wrong. You should have warned me, Martin. Yeah, it was hard enough to play it in, sort of in, in the normal clothes. Hmm. It's the pause that make it difficult to play. And talking of pause, let's take one of those right now. Hi, it's Ian Anderson and... Martin Barr. I thought it was you. Back with you talking here. about our reminiscing reminiscing the 25 years of Jethro Tull. Well, War Child was a funny record because that came about again with a sort of uh, a little preparatory period, as I recall, of being in Switzerland when I was writing some stuff, which sort of became 
became War Child almost by default. I think I was there with David Palmer running some music with a view to it being some kind of musical or something, and uh, and uh, whatever it was, it became the War Child thing. I always thought about it being a movie as well. It was a most peculiar time. I was always thinking of music that wasn't just going to be an album, it was either going to be you know, the movie, or it was going to be the stage musical, or something else as well as just being a record. I think it would have been far better if we just concentrated on making decent records, but War Child did pretty well. I know it's one of Richie Blackmore's personal favourite records of all time, Martin. Well, he's a great, He's a great fan of yours, isn't he? <laughs> well, he's a great, Excuse fan me of, laughing. great fan of your hairline. Uh, yes, I suppose he, he would admire it. Yes, he was quite right, too. Mm -hmm. I mean... Yeah, had, growth had, alone. Had some pretty good songs on the uh, yeah. War Child. It was a good, yeah. fun one, and we did a lot of tours. I think we went up to Australia and New Zealand, places like that, for the first time, which made it a an interesting year for us, 1974. Busy year. Again, lots of touring, and uh, we had to come back with an album that was going to be a little bit more to the point, and less uh, pompous and overbearing than Passion Play had been, so it was just a bunch of songs. And yeah, they, they were okay. good, good songs. Mm. But they're more sort of in a, a normal song format, weren't they? And they're more straightforward, more yeah. sort of guitar, but not quite to the heavy riff, but going that way. Yeah, and, then, and, and gave us a, <clears throat> a quite a conspicuous hit, I think, in America with a song called Bungle in the Jungle, which uh, actually became uh, a sort of meaningful top 20 singles hit, I think, over mm -hmm. there. It was also the year uh, that we introduced the, the female musicians into the group. I, ah, I the, believe. the string yes. quartet, mm -hmm. the ladies in the white powdered wigs and the mm -hmm. ever-so-tight dresses. Gosh, well, that was a load of trouble, wasn't it? Well, it certainly produced a little trouble for some of the <laughs> band. <laughs> hey, Mart. <laughs> now, actually, you, 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 I think you and I were the only innocent parties, yeah. which is why we, I, think we should, I think we should dwell on this topic a little longer now that we've yeah. pinned it down to those other guys. Yeah. But no, it was it wasn't the best best thing in the world. Taking, um, I mean, they were ever so you know ever so uh, friendly and nice girls and terrific players in the in the classical context. But they didn't find it easy translating their way of playing into uh, the sort of rock context. I think they enjoyed it, but they they were um, a little fretful from time to time. Mm. Probably because the lack of the lack of frets mm. makes it somewhat difficult, doesn't yeah, it? Never did hear them on stage. If you can't, that's right. They couldn't hear themselves. <laughs> we couldn't really hear them. And uh, mm. but they they gave uh, they made a good effort. They look good. Yeah, I think that's really what we hired them for, isn't it? Mm. The truth be known. Yeah, it certainly kept John Evans off the streets for a couple of tours. That's for sure. Yeah. Anyway, um, moving quickly on. Moving quickly on <laughs> to 1975. Off we go in 1975 with our mobile recording studio, which we'd made, the Maison Rouge Mobile, 24-track recording studio in the back of a truck, and we set off, this time, <laughs> to Monte Carlo. And let's see if we can test Martin's bar. Martin's bar. <laughs> we'll test Martin's bar. It's a good idea. It's time for a drink. Martin's bar. His memory of the the cafe that we used to frequent in Monte Carlo for our lunch. I'm very straight. Um, I know how we got to the cafe on mopeds. On mopeds, because we, we, we were the mopeds. sort of anti-heroes. We, uh, there was everybody driving around in Porsches and Ferraris and yeah. Maseratis, and and we sort of hired mopeds for the duration and became the scourge of. Monte Carlo. That's right. We're one of the last great moped bands, actually, of, mm, the, of that yeah. era, I it's thought. Not a well-known fact. So. It, was, it was known to us as the Poisoneria, Martin. Yeah. Okay. It was um, because it served uh, sort of horse flesh and other sort of rather dubious-looking things. Mm -hmm. And it was on that hill that you went down to, yeah. taking you down towards the, the sort of harbour area. What was it called? Poisoneria. Mm. I, I remember yeah. it very well, because I remember sitting there very very bored and everybody just spends their whole life looking at each other in Monte Carlo and we just suddenly decided uh, to get up and run out obviously <laughs> leaving someone else to pay the bill well that was the idea actually after fact we had paid but of course everybody else thought we hadn't paid and it just gave somebody gave them something to look at ah yeah and was not a, a jape it was indeed yes how tedious we were bored weren't yes. we <laughs> That's right. But we were staying in the hotel down there while we while we rehearsed and recorded uh, Minstrel in the Gallery, 
which we, um, we used the radio station studio with our mobile parked outside to actually record it all and we wrote and recorded minutes from the gallery there and uh, then quickly shot off to do a few more tours in all those usual exciting places. But I, I remember Monte Carlo for one other thing, Martin, which was it was when you suddenly took a very expensive liking to Gosh. the entire contents mm. of a furniture store. I can't but, remember that. So it was the kind of place that you had to have at mm. least two Rolls Royces to be able to <laughs> walk through the door, and you bought the lot. You <laughs> and spent unbelievable amounts of money on this furniture, which I, I mm. think some of it you still have. It's funny, I don't remember that at all. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, that, yes, yes. It's funny, that, isn't it? The 25 Yes, eccentric. Piece. Yes. It was the, my eccentric year. Mm. And I, I even had a white suit. If you can believe that. Well. That I didn't wear on stage. This was, <laughs> I remember wearing it to oh, go well, and just, eat it. Just to torture us, you refused, <laughs> to, you refused to wear it on stage. Well, thanks, Mark. I think you wouldn't let me. Mm. And uh, at the end of the year, we, we changed to sort of less uh, exotic uh, destination, being Brussels, which sort of seemed grey and cold and fairly miserable place where we recorded too old to rock and roll. Actually, technically in the same year, it was 1975, we did both the Minstrel mm -hmm. album yeah. in the early part of the year, and then we went back after a tour or two to do too old to rock and roll, but we... We wound up again, as you say, in a miserable midwinter in Brussels, mm -hmm. where we actually did the title track, Too Old to Rock and Roll, and The Checkered Flag, mm -hmm. one or two other songs that we, we actually recorded in Brussels. And Maddie Pryor came over to, to add her the vocals. vocals. Yes, and of course, by that time, John Glasscock was, uh, had replaced Jeffrey Hammond in the band, uh, John having been the, uh, the bass player with a group called Carmen, who were one of our support bands in America the year before. And... Uh, and John was uh, sort of uh, a kind of slightly new new element in the band since he was uh, a natural kind of bass player. Jeffrey, on the other hand, had been one of those guys who just learned everything note by note and didn't really quite understand what he was playing, but did so very well and performed very well. Whereas John was a guy who who just kind of let him just played in the song and he kind of knew instant instinctively and instantly what he had to play. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a kind of easier album to make, I think, till to rock and roll. Again, yeah. one that was not uh, started off again as some idea for something else, rather than just an album, and sort of became a Jethro Tull album by default. But uh, gave us a couple of good tunes. I know they used the tune "Too Old to Rock and Roll" was one of the ones that they used to flush out uh, that Noriega chap out of his uh, embassy hidey hole. Yeah. Do you remember they they decided a psychological <laughs> yeah. warfare? They would play exceedingly loud and nasty <laughs> rock and roll to try and force out <laughs> the um, dictator from his bolt hole. And I'm told that Tilt to Rock and Roll was one of the things they played at him several times a day until he came up with his hands <laughs> out, or came out with his hands up. Um, mm, he probably had them out for a while before. Back to Blighty for the next album in 1977, one called Songs from the Wood. And apart from the uh, fiendishly difficult uh, title track, um, contain again a bunch of uh, interesting songs that probably had more of a, not exactly a folky feel, but certainly had, in terms of subject matter, something to do with our uh, country of origin. I think we spent so many years away on tour and recording in different countries, it was a kind of a, a natural reaction against all of that internationalism that brought us back into uh, not only recording in the UK, but making an album of songs that had their roots in terms of musical style and lyrics sort of back more in our kind of home place although looking back on it it might have been a little bit quaint and twee and dangerously close to that music that you and i both loathe and detest not, not the f word the big f word yeah the capital f I can't word say it. <laughs> folk music yeah so anyway martin and i are really not folk fans at all and a lot of people think of Jethro Tull as some kind of folk rock band, but they are confusing us with our very good friends, Fairport Convention, who are uh, indeed the folk rock band of all time, and uh, sport in their uh, frontline bass playing department, another Jethro Tull member, Dave Pegg, who does double duty with the Fairports and Jethro Tull. And indeed, over the years, we've had a few other Fairport members have, uh, have played with us, both on record and on tour. And uh, all except Simon Nickel, the guitar player, mm -hmm. the only guy who's not been with Jethro Tull. 
That's right. Isn't that curious? I'm sure he he sang pro- something. Um, he sang um, "Skating Away." Oh, that's right. He, did, and he played bass. Yes. Yes, on a tour. Yes. That's, that's true. He he, but he's never been on record. I don't no. Think. That's no. Right. It was a uh, um, songs from the wood. Would that that have been David's David Palmer's first album? It was the first one. He, member of the first group. one he got paid for. <laughs> or at least properly paid for as a group member, yeah. you're quite right. Yeah. And, and he did uh, some arranging. Yeah, and indeed, I mean, the band, the band were all very instrumental in the arrangements on mm-hmm. that album. I remember because I, 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 I know I would leave the, the rehearsal room sometimes for an hour or two and, and kind of leave everybody else just to fiddle around with some idea on their own and come up with some middle section or instrumental bit or what have you. And uh, it kind of gave everybody a chance to put a little bit of their own ideas into the uh, some of the instrumental music, which is why some of it, I guess, is so complicated, because <laughs> I like a simple life. <laughs> it's funny, actually, all the ones where the rest of the band get really heavily into the arrangement part of it were Thick as a Brick, Passion Play, Songs from the Wood, I mean, just to name a few, uh, mm-hmm. or indeed later on the A album, about which we will talk. I mean, the, it's, it's, the complicated Interrupt. ones are actually not my fault. <laughs> you other guys mm. are looking to make life difficult mm. for yourselves and for me. Self-inflicted torture. Absolutely. It's our own faults. Yeah. Well, leaving behind 1977 into 78 with another album, still with a kind of Englishy, Britishy sort of ethnic influence about it, Songs from the Wood, which uh, had quite a good title track that... Um, uh, well, I mean, I like it as a song, but uh, another one of those ones that's sort of rather episodic, has lots of different movements within it, so it's, uh, it's quite a handful. Not too difficult to play, just difficult to remember all the bits, I mm. think. Yeah, it's good fun to play, and it's got lots of different moods of music in it. Hmm. Mm. What, what's your all-time... I mean, what song do you dread playing the most, or did you dread playing the most, just from the point of view of being difficult to execute, difficult to to make it right? Ah, on the spot. (laughs) Uh, hmm. Well, I'm surprised that that one doesn't come to mind at all. And I don't know why, because it should do. I I, I think the, the music I found the hardest to play was Passion Play. So I, I remember rehearsing that and having incredible problems playing it. I mean, that was probably the 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 only time where I, I really almost couldn't play it. Uh, and I've, I've never found anything easy got, ever, but that was that was certainly the extreme yeah. of of almost impossible to play. Almost to the point of pulling out somebody else's hair. <laughs> Yeah, I know what you mean, Martin. Well, passion play was it. I think it was difficult actually because it wasn't so difficult to play. It was just difficult to remember it yeah. all because you didn't have any let up. It was just so mm-hmm. intense, and you really had to, at all times, have your wits about you, just knowing what was coming next. And I suppose even now, playing, you know, going on stage for a couple of hours and having to play the stuff we play now, over all those years, apart from perhaps also always being a few new songs that we're perhaps playing for the <clears> first time, but it's the it's the mental side of it. I mean, the actual feat of memory to, re- to just recall thousands of notes mm. in the right order. Mm. And all of this, you know, done mm. without the aid of music manuscript or, mm. you know, or too much in the way of any kind of prompts. I mean, you mm. really just have to, you've got to know it. Mm-hmm. And it's, um, I think it's one of the things that keeps us so young, you know, Martin. I think that's, it's exercising our brains mm. rather than our bodies. Yeah. So but I do, think is really almost the most important yeah. aspect of keeping <laughs> ourselves as youthful and as energetic and as intensely human as I think you and I both and are. Mm. Yeah, if only you could lose calories that way. You, you could. You could go back to Rose's really cafe hard. and pig out. In fact, <laughs> in fact, try this one on, Cher, baby. Instead of having mm. to do all those hours and hours of ridiculous, serious, physical, you know, calorie-burning stuff, why not let's us martin you and me let's do it let's do let's do a lose weight get trim video and we'll send the first copy to share and it's how to think yourself thin i think we could I'm do thinking that. right now me too <laughs> god you're skinny <laughs> so you soon. skinny bitch it works it works 
On into 1979 with Ian Anderson and Martin <coughs> Barr here talking about the Stormwatch album. Stormwatch, Martin, that was a, a, a tough one for us because I know poor old John Glasgow had had some health problems and we went through quite a bit of that album, I think, with me having to play the bass parts because he, he did yeah. maybe four or five songs and we had to finish it without him because he went mm -hmm. through his, his uh, heart operations yeah. and things. I think it ended up with uh, you, me and Barry doing quite a few tracks just the three of us. Hmm. Yeah. So certainly the backing tracks. Yeah, it was. Uh, it wasn't an easy album to make, and um, again, one of those that was perhaps the albums preceded, preceding it had had their kind of warmth to them. I think Stormwatch is a kind of cold album. It's. Uh, it is. It is. It's all that kind of. It's just in the nature of it. We we seem to make, if not quite alternative. I mean, or, or rather alternate albums. We seem to make. You know, every second or third one seems to be a kind of chilly, lacking in humour kind of an album that that um, doesn't make it a bad album. Just makes it a kind of slightly, uh, you know, slightly more kind of a down thing. It's uh, I I don't I wonder if that's just a na is that the way we play it or is it the songs I write? I never really quite understand what why some things turn out with that kind of degree of lightness. You know, that kind of little bit of humour or warmth about them that seems to make I mean that's what separates say albums like Stand Up and uh, Crest of an A perhaps mm -hmm. you know from albums that are kind of a bit more down a bit more dark sounding like like the Benefit album or mm -hmm. or indeed uh, Stormwatch as we're saying yeah, I think that there was a lot of tension there at the time and I, I, th I think the same as you that it sort of came out in the album, but and it wasn't the songs. It's just maybe the way they were played. It's there's some the emotion that goes into playing it, it. It must come through on the finished result. But as you say, it seems that there's a swing of the pendulum from one year to the next. There's an album that uh, sort of goes to the left, and then you sort of back on course with the next one. But but it seems to be a, a necessary part of. of, of playing for so many years that you do have albums that that do go out on a limb. Tough back then as well because we really were, not just we, I think all bands were expected to come out with a new album really every year and it was, mm -hmm. it was always very, very pressured to have that upon you in terms of writing the songs, rehearsing and recording them along with, you know, the need to go and play four or five major tours in different countries of the world so that there seemed to be never a moment when we weren't actually, you know, behind <coughs> schedule on something. That was really part of the pressure. Yeah. You know, it only takes a... I mean, you only need a month or two to remove a lot of that pressure. I think that's maybe the difference between now and then. You know, it's just having that, that couple of weeks here, a month there, where you can back off and not have to be so intense about music that makes it now so much more enjoyable when you do go out and tour, you do go to make, make a record. I mean, now... I think we all sort of feel eager and kind of excited and enthused mm -hmm. about doing music just because we do have that luxury of having a couple of weeks off. Yeah. Which really makes it, I mean, in some ways, maybe more than two or three weeks off is, is counterproductive. But I, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I really value those little moments just to step back from music now and, you know, kind of mm. recharge those uh, dreaded batteries. But that's what it's about, isn't it? Yeah, it, uh, it, it's, it amazes me that, that I find music a lot more fun to play now than I ever did and I don't know why that there's nothing's really changed but it's just an attitude I think I think it's probably because you do spend time away from it and, and even though I'm, I'm always playing I think it's a sort of healthy getting a healthy attitude towards what you do but, of course but now playing all those songs seem a lot more fun than they ever did even the songs from the, the older albums yeah well we get to pick and choose to some extent. I mean, obviously the 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 audience kind of like to pick and choose as well. There are always some songs that they're, they're going to want us to play that we would have difficulty in playing at all or with any great frequency. But out of 200 and something or other songs that we've recorded, I mean, we, we have a fair amount to choose from in the sense mm -hmm. that we can keep ourselves uh, fairly amused and, and not have to play too many songs for more than a tour or so without being able to switch to something else. Yeah. In fact, there really only when I was going through <coughs> trying to devise a set list actually for these coming tours, I, I, I had in my head there were probably six or seven songs that were the ones that we just always play. 
But in fact, it only came down to about four or five. Mm -hmm. um, thick as a brick, aqualung, locomotive breath. These days, probably living in the past, since that's crept back into the set. Um, I mean, I admit, there'd be another one there somewhere that I can't think of. But other than that, pretty much everything else is on... Uh, you know, is, is is very changeable. There are really actually only four or five songs that are always in the Jethro Tull show. Yeah. Mm. Well, you, I, the other one I've just remembered that, that has been in for a few years now is Farm on the Freeway. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, it, but they don't not, tire. Not as many yeah. as you think. No, no. But then I, I think we get invaluable feedback through New Day magazine. I mean, that, that they, to me, that they are a, a great asset because they're sort of brutally honest uh with their opinions and f fans have a uh a, a way of being brutally honest <laughs> yeah absolutely I, th I think that's an important thing as well so we get to know what people like and dislike yeah well i i i, I appreciate actually the brutal honesty from from the fans damn their eyes <laughs> because <laughs> In in some ways, it's a lot. It's a lot more. Uh, I mean, if you, if you get some real serious bit of criticism from someone that you know has probably spent hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars on concert tickets and records, I mean, a you've got to take it seriously, and they probably know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. It may be, you know, a very isolated personal opinion, but you really do have to listen to what they say. It's it's much more meaningful and poignant to take that kind of thing into account than it ever is listening to the kind of carping criticism from somebody who just hates the band anyway. Yep. Um, there are always those people who want to write, not too many, but the occasional bad review that we do get um, you know, for a concert somewhere is probably somebody who just hates the band anyway. And mm -hmm. Usually they, they end up saying that mm -hmm. somewhere in their, uh, in their review. Yeah. They never liked us, they never will, and this was no exception kind of thing. Mm. <laughs> it makes you wonder why bother to come in the first place. Mm. Hi, this is Martin Barr and Ian Anderson of Jethro Tull, and we're talking about 25 years of the band, and we're now at 1980 and the A album. Yeah, which really began its life as an intended solo album, and uh, in the process of writing a few songs, um, I uh, summoned up the undisputed talents of Eddie Jobson, who'd recently been with Frank Zappa and prior to that Roxy Music. Um, also, also played in a band that supported us, UK, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And Eddie came over to play some keyboards and brought his drummer, Mark Cranny, with him. And Dave Pegg came along to play some bass bits, and then we invited you to come and do some guitar pieces, and we ended mm -hmm. up, before we knew it, making a, an album which really became another Jess Hotel album rather than a solo album. And um, although it was a little bit more electronic in the sense of having Eddie's uh, grandiose keyboards, um, it had you know, a few pretty good songs on it, including one or two that we have played a lot on stage. So um, that really took us uh, pretty much through 1980 in terms of the tours that supported the A album and uh, was the one where I think we were all dressed up in parish, white parachute nylon suits, which is okay for you non-sweating kind of guys, <laughs> but for those of us who perspire a little in our lower regions, it... Uh, Mm. There wasn't a lot left to the imagination. They weren't the in, most in, in in my suit department, mm. anyway. What not, do you think, Martin? You, um, were, you were standing behind me. You uh, probably saw a lot of things swinging around yeah, there and have been seen. I, I must say that probably the least flattering of uh, of all stage gear would be the A album uh, little numbers. Mm. I've still got my view. Um, I had to throw mine away. I think. Because yeah. also it was when I was extremely large oh, you were in frame. You were I was a little tubby, tubby little right, person yeah. then, and uh, mm. it's rather a large piece of clothing. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Martin, I've still got mine, so uh, I think I'll get it, uh, if I get it flame-proofed, I might wear it to your next Barbie. <laughs> Barbies, yeah, we have Barbies. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I don't do yeah. that kind of stuff. I always smoked a, a turkey, this is really Did interesting. You? Well, you it's shouldn't very do that. good. It's very bad well, for your lungs. Yeah, <laughs> I thought you only smoked menthol ones anyway. <laughs> only smoke menthol, menthol, mm -hmm. menthol, menthol turkeys, menthol turkeys, Martin, because uh, it kind of gives you a nice, uh, 
a nice little buzz. I, you, when you did smoke them, and it used to be a, an exotic Swiss-sounding <clears throat> brand name, I seem to recall, I always remember it used to light one up before the Encore in a cigarette yeah. holder, yeah. and invariably the smoke would go in your eyes, mm -hmm. so you had to go out and mm. do the beginning of locomotive breath yeah. with tears running down your face and not being able to see where you were mm. going. But the people, the audience, are very convinced. They just thought, God, he, he must... L you know, yep. be really moved by that piece of music. Either that or being very kind and considerate, Martin, and not wanting to embarrass you. Yeah, so oh, God, look, Martin, Martin's <laughs> been trying to smoke again. Look, he's not cut out for this at all. <laughs> A failed smoker. In 81 and 1982, we spent quite a long time doing the, um, the sort of... Uh, writing and arranging and revaluating band members bit and I seem to remember at that point I did quite a lot of uh, of uh, stuff with um, uh, you Dave and an old friend Jerry Conway who had played in early days with uh, some bands I think who supported us way back in the Mist of time. Cat Stevens. Yeah, Cat Stevens. Fothering Gay was another one he played. Mm. Anyway, Jerry was a great drummer. Jerry still is a pretty good drummer. Yeah. Um, he's even fatter now, of course. Yeah. But a uh, pretty good drummer, and he was um, he always had a really good feel, very musical drummer. Whenever he played, even though he had a fairly simple style, mm. it was very musical, very, very, um, very well thought out and structured kind of parts that he would play. But but unlike a lot of guys who think about it too much and then lose the feel. Jerry was just great on feel. I mean, really yep. good guy to play with when he was, you know, confident with the parts that he had. So we did quite a bit of rehearsals, I seem to remember it, in this very room where we're now sitting, writing uh, and arranging pieces uh, during 81. And although we went on to record the album in 82, rather than 81, um, a lot of those early demos and uh, some in 24 track form still survive uh, to this day. And one of my tasks later this year is to embarrass you um, yet again by mm, you. throwing at you some of these unreleased uh, songs mm. that feature us in uh, in stylistic um, uh, adventure because I think it would be true to say that a lot of these things that no one else has heard yet are not really kind of mainstream Jethro Tull songs. They're, they're sort of things that didn't make it onto the album because they didn't really kind of fit in, in style terms. They're kind ah, of now I remember them well. Yeah. Yeah, I remember them. Yeah, mm. I've actually got some rough mixes mm. sitting right behind your chair, really? funnily enough. Yeah. It wasn't something about group night? Uh, crew, night, crew, crew nights, nights crew yeah, nights. Yeah. yeah, yeah, about roadies parties. Mm. I recall. Yeah. Anyway, but that will be unleashed on the uh, Jethro Tull other box mm. set um, in December of uh, 1993, um, with any luck, if it sounds as okay as I think it sounds from the the cursory listen that I've given it. But anyway, in '82 we did the the, the broadsword album, and uh, surprisingly. Although it was a very popular Jethro Tell album in Europe, it was one of our least popular albums in America, which is strange because it was, you know, it had some pretty good solid kind of rock type things on it, as well as things that had that. I thought I thought, I thought it was a good all-round Jethro Tell album. I think really, its lack of popularity in the U.S. had more to do with the mood of the times because it mm -hmm. was that sort of period when people were still flirting with that kind of punk and new wave thing. And bands like us were definitely right out of fashion, and I think we really suffered by not having a terribly convincing amount of radio play or promotion at that time. It's a shame because it's a really good album. I mean, yeah, it's certainly one so, of so. my favourites, yeah. and one in which I know you played unbelievably well, Martin. <laughs> Even now, I <laughs> frequently find myself with a, just that hint of an <laughs> erection when I listen to that oh, guitar okay. solo. Well, I'm the end. Shall I <laughs> mm. In fact, I feel it coming on again right now, so we better change the subject. Let's move on, shall we, to 1983. Hi, Ian Anderson and Martin Barr here talking about Jethro Tell's 25 years of recording history. And in 1983, I took the dangerous step of working with our new keyboard player, Peter Vitesi, to do some recording really just on my own, as, a, as this time the real solo album. And because... I can't for the life of me remember very much either about it or indeed why I was doing it, other than I think I wanted to get away from doing guitar type things and acoustic things, which I was sort of known for, and, and go for more of an electronic sound. But I'm going to ask you, Martin, mm -hmm. to give me 
uh, you know, mm-hmm. your thoughts on that album as a, someone who stood for the most part on the outside, although mm-hmm. we did yeah. actually play some of that material live, mm-hmm. um, both on TV and uh, in concert. Yeah, that's right. No, but I, I, I think that it's a, a terrible shame that we don't play some of those numbers on stage. I, 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 th- I actually thought they were really, really good songs. And <laughs> being a guitar player and being slightly biased, I could listen to them and just think, with with some guitar here and there, mm. they're, they're actually great songs for guitar parts as well. I think you put a, a, a bit of guitar on, but uh, there are lots of things that, that they had a great feel and fairly heavy. Yeah, some I mean, of the things they're... that would lend themselves really I think, well. I think they suffered really from being just so keyboard dominated, yeah. and, and and also the fact that it was a drum machine. And uh, mm. you know, I, given real drums and you know a bit of sort of real guitar type playing, I think the, you know yeah. it would have been a much more popular effort. However, yeah. we learn both by technology and our mistakes, and sometimes technology and mistakes go hand in hand. <laughs> back 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 to the wood, isn't it? Really, these days we actually play the instruments yeah. um, in the way in which nature intended. Mm-hmm. I, we beat mm-hmm. each other over the head with them sometimes. Yeah. But they're, I, I'm, it's back to that sort of real human feel thing again. I hate all that synthesizer. I hate the manuals. That's what I hate yeah. the most, reading those wretched, you know, Japanese pidgin English manuals. If I have to read one more bloody manual about bloody mm-hmm. synthesizers or effects processors, I will kill somebody, starting with myself. And it could be difficult to finish the job if well, I do it in that order. But I might leave meat till last because I'm a nice kind of guy. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think to, to me the saddest sight is seeing uh, a, a keyboard player who's probably spent thousands of pounds pressing these little buttons, and then in the window comes up the whatever it is, the piano or the piccolo or f- flute sounds. I mean, that they are so such t- terribly synthesised full sounds but it's, it's such a the, the sight of all these and the sound of all these terrible things coming out of this piece of plastic I just think I'd hate to have to spend that sort of money and have to deal with that sort of thing that that, that is that would be your instrument I mean to me if I was a keyboard player I'd have a, a grand piano and a Hammond organ and refuse to, to play anything else a bit like John Evans yeah that's right mm. Well, I, I had the, I'm not sure whether it was, I'm not sure whether it was a pleasure or not, there was one fairly well-known manufacturer's piece of equipment, a box of, uh, you know, sample-type sounds that actually did feature, um, and I can't remember how, what they called it, but it was clearly meant to be me playing the flute mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a, a sample or a synthesized-type replica. And, um, um, you know, and I suppose it's, a, it's recognition of a sort, but... It's just a rather strange idea that not only do you press the button and get sort of a flute lighting up in your window and then a flute-like mm-hmm. sound coming out of the keyboard, but you can actually get Ian Anderson's flute-like sound coming mm-hmm. out of your keyboard, which I don't have a problem with. It's just that if you're nice to me and you send me a 24-track tape, I might actually just play it on, on your record for free, which I, I quite often... Well, let me not start a trend <laughs> here that Oops. I can't uh, keep up with. But, I mean, I, I do. I mean, once every so often. I'm up actually jumping on a plane two days' time to go and play on a TV show in uh, in Germany where just somebody sent me their tape on spec and said could you pl- add a bit of flute to this and I had a bit of flute to it and the guy got a record deal and now he's uh, he's got a you know a, a major uh, national primetime TV show you know for his song and uh, and he asked me to come and play live on it me and and now we're going to do a little name dropping here me see how many of these people you mm-hmm. you remember Martin Jack Bruce yes there's me and Jack, mm-hmm. and Jack and me, mm-hmm. and there's me and Jack, and there's uh, Dave. That's David Dave. Clayton Thomas. Oh yes, yeah. Blood, sweat, and tears. So there's me and Jack and Dave, Dave, Jack, mm-hmm. and me, and Bobby Kimball from um, Toto. So there's me, yeah. Bobby, Jack, and Dave, Dave, Jack, Bobby, and me, and uh, I can't remember who else. But anyway, it's sort of a bunch of us. Who <laughs> Phil Collins. <laughs> Yeah, he's bound to be Brian there somewhere. Yeah, they'll be there. I'm oh, sure and be there. Uh, Stasis Quo. Absolutely. All they'll all be popping out of their guitar <laughs> cases, yes. Legs akimbo. <laughs> Wallets akimbo. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll all be there. Anyway, but sometimes I do go and play on people's records when they ask me. And I don't... I, I, I'm usually such a... 
I'm too embarrassed to ask for money because sometimes what I do, I think, oh God, they're going to be really disappointed. You know, they mm. they always just say, oh well, do what you do. You know, play flute. Mm. You know, like you do, and that's all very well. But I don't know what it is that I do, and um, I just kind of <laughs> always feel like they're going to get their tape back with my humble mm. addition and think, oh, he didn't do it like he does. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always kind of embarrassing, but anyway, a couple of a couple I played on recently turned out okay. I did my uh, first saxophone session. Did you really? Two weeks ago. Did you get paid? surprised? Um, funnily enough, I didn't. No. No, I really? thought I'd better do it for nothing. Hmm. <laughs> Just as well. Good. Oh, it's, I got a, it was for a heavy metal band as well. Was it really? And yeah. they adopted the saxophone as a as a sort of a an additional lead instrument, well, they, or you? Kind of tootling along in the background. They, they were they'd put a synthesizer line playing a saxophone sound, and and I just happened to walk in the studio and and say that I just bought a saxophone. You just happened to announce I just happened that. To, just which happened was to, just a fatal mistake. That moment, yeah. mm, a, a terrible error. And of course they said, well, that's just what we need. We don't want a synthesizer. We want the real thing. Unfortunately, they, they didn't get it. For you. <laughs> that's right. They never okay. did get it. Well, we mm. seem to have wandered yeah. off the subject yet yeah. again, Martin, Course. because Sorry. I think I think we've pretty firmly there put an end to 1983, and we can move mm. on to 1984 and the and the album Under Wraps, where <laughs> Peter Vitesse on keyboards, you, me, and Dave, we did an album that was very much a, a kind of another electronic and synthesizer album. If if my solo Walk Into Light album was uh, anything to to be a precursor of, it was it was the the um, the Under Wraps album because we use that very keyboardish kind of thing again, yeah. but I mean, it really does have some great song. I mean, that's one mm -hmm. of, from a song point of view, and also from the point of view of my my singing. It was the last year where I I really could still sing pretty well, and uh, the great irony was that it was going out and doing that '84 tour of Under Wraps that uh, um, kind of seriously damaged my voice as a result of, uh, um, I suppose, undertaking not only the the amount of shows that we did, but also so many of the songs that really involved singing kind of to my limits in terms of the the effort also that album featured a, a couple of songs that you had um a hand in writing Marshall. oh yes oh, i've forgotten about that yeah I, the, the, oh, yeah by the way do you want paying for that <laughs> it just just suddenly crossed my mind actually yeah uh, how much do i owe you well you can, buy me, you can buy me a drink i'll tell you what glass what? of wine I'll settle for a glass of wine. Well, what I was going to do is, as a humble <laughs> offering, was I would agree to buy your saxophone off you. But never mind. No. <laughs> but you haven't heard it yet. Of course, yeah, you've heard about it. So um, I think taking chances, Mark. Mm, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, you yeah. wrote. Well, I, I was, in in general, that album was a, a lot of fun to record. Uh, not saying that the ones in the past had been, but I think out of all the albums that we did, it just seems to be sort of trouble free and. Uh, so it, everything sort of fell together so easily, and, and it was just—it it was the most endurable album up to then that, that I'd ever been involved with. Perhaps that was because, or at least had something to do with the fact that we recorded it not in a commercial recording studio with engineers mm. and tape arts, but we actually yeah. all just sat in this room around a mixer, and we all mm. kind of sort of engineered it and mixed it together. Because I mean, we all yeah. kind of we just. There wasn't just nobody else here. It was just us, the guys, mm. the musicians, in mm -hmm. one room, and we operated the equipment. There was no feeling mm. that there was, uh, you know, any sort of. Uh, you weren't. You didn't have an audience, so you could be a little braver in trying things out, and you know, yeah. no one that you were having to pay by the hour that would be looking at their watch, thinking, oh, "God, mm. aren't these musicians going on a mm. lot today?" I, I, yeah, I, think I, so. I That's really since then. In fact, is the reason I've always worked at home recording, mm. and I know. You have your own home recording studio, well, commercial home recording mm -hmm. studio, but uh, I mean, it really does make such a lot of difference. Oh, it does. You've spent so many years travelling yeah. in your life, and you can actually step out of your house and walk the the few yards to your studio, and then do a real serious <laughs> day's work. I mean, you just cut out and all that wasted travelling time, the hotels, mm. the the laundry. I mean, everything that goes with that itinerant lifestyle it is nice to be able to work at home and if it yeah. sounds like an unbelievable luxury i mean let's not forget that these days the the home recording studio whether it's a you know a four track quarter studio or it's a you know 24 track digital whatever extreme under which you work i mean so much professional i mean commercially released music is being made in people's own homes these days and that was a revolution that began really only 10 years ago 
Mm-hmm. That, yeah. that was the moment. That was <clears> when I, you know, sold my uh, commercial studios in London, the Maison Rouge mm-hmm. studios, because I realised for a fraction of the cost I could build a studio at home and have the same, the same quality and not have to travel two hours to work every day. But and listening to Under Wraps, so it, it's one of the few albums that, that I actually play to enjoy rather than as a reference. I'm sure you're, you're the same. You sort of listen to old albums purely as a reference to learn old material. But I, I do actually enjoy, mm-hmm. in fact, the A album is the other one uh, that I think sounds really good. But Under Wraps, it's a, it's a great album. I and think and I think be, it's, what would be a really good idea is that we should give Doan, Doan Perry, our drummer, we should give him the. Uh, the 24 track tape and because I know he has uh, a room at home he can probably borrow a borrow a tape machine and uh, and we should get him to replace the drum machine with with <laughs> rip you're laughing Martin now <laughs> what why is this not a good I thought it was a great idea well, we'll keep him busy for a few months <laughs> <laughs> well that's right and I was going to follow it up to say and of course for the privilege of being allowed to play on a Jess yeah. Hotel album that he otherwise only performed on tour yeah. um, then I'm sure he would probably pay us for the privilege of, uh, of being allowed to be mm. the real time drummer Mm. And um, as you say, it's, I mean, he's mm. going to pay us to keep him busy for a few months. Mm. Sounds a pretty good deal to me. Hi, this is Ian Anderson and Martin Barr talking about Jeff Hotel's 25 years at the, uh, well, not at the top, sort of clinging, clinging tenaciously halfway <laughs> up the ladder or halfway down, depending on your point of view. But 19, uh, 1985 is a funny year because I, I took most of that year off partly because of the problems I had with my voice in 84 and partly because of uh, having a number of other interests outside music that were uh, developing to the point where I really felt I should spend a few months um, moving that side of my activities on a pace. So I think 85 was a very, very quiet year, about which, which I can say very little other than one, uh, the Bach tricentenary live television mm-hmm. uh, thing that we did in mm-hmm. Germany to celebrate yeah. Bach's 300 years. And um, I don't think he, I don't think he even had a CD box set to celebrate it back then. Mm. But we did a, that, apart from that one TV yeah. thing where we did the as yet unreleased uh, double violin concerto, in which Eddie Jobson came over from America to to play yeah. real violin on. Yeah, um, on the Light album. Mm, we didn't do too much else that year. At least I didn't. No. I think we also played on a piece that David Palmer did called Coronach for a, a theme for a British TV series. But other than that, uh, I, I don't. I wasn't doing anything in music. I was busy up, uh, you know, with things slimy and fish-like. Um, I was. But enough of those home. girls. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Martin, what were you up to? Me, I, I was. I think I was vainly trying to write songs, and still am. <laughs> but I think I, I just sat at home trying to write bits of music, and probably the the. Uh, the remnants of that year are on cassettes to join the many other cassettes of material that will get thrown away. Mm. That was probably also the year that you started to think thin. I suspect right. it was around then that you started oh, no, to become been. You know, concerned with your um, mm. diet and sort of being running and you know, getting into your um, current state of physical trim. Mm. Because one of the interesting things about guys like <coughs> us, and, and this obviously affects a lot of people in you know, performers in the music industry is that as you do get older, you, you do become aware every night you walk out on stage that the audience may be a half or even a third of, of your age. And um, it starts to become not only a question of vanity, but also a question of responsibility. Even if, like us, you can't look terrific, you still want to feel pretty good and know that you're not going to snuff it on the spot through cardiac arrest it's in the middle of the encore. Totally or messy. even worse, in the second song, then the mm. punches are really going to scream for their mm. money back. And the, the roadies wouldn't clear us away anyway. No, we'd be left there, yeah. rotting debris on the stage. We wouldn't want to touch it. just think the, the next act in, they'd come in yeah. and say, God, who, what are these you know, <laughs> rotting, sort of aging... Good God, that must be Tutankhamen. <laughs> No, it's not. It's Martin Barr from Jess Hotel. <laughs> Shit, we were actually going to have an Egyptian yeah, relic exhibition. Br- Recognise the feet. Yeah. <laughs> mm. The mummified remains of Jethro Tull. Mm. The roadies didn't even clear them up. Now, what a sad thought. It is, isn't it? 1986, and we went back into the studio with a bunch of songs that, uh, well, I suppose um, 
in some ways were a little bit of a return or at least an acknowledgement of our blues roots. From my point of view, that was the case, because although I was still writing songs, some of which were uh, keyboard oriented, um, they ended up, you know, with a good healthy dose of uh, of fairly bluesy rock kind of guitar. And uh, so when we finished that album, as yet untitled, having done songs like... Uh, Steel Monkey and Budapest and Farm on the Freeway. Um, it had that definite feeling of being an album that, whilst on the one hand revisiting some uh, sort of earlier Jethro Tull territory, it still had a kind of contemporary feeling in the sense of, of the songs. Although a few pundits did point out, fairly in some ways and not fairly in others, that there was a, a little bit of a kind of dire straits or even a ZZ Top feel to some of it. Somebody asked me that the other day. Gosh, really? Yeah, and that I had to tell that. I had me. to tell that that that, <laughs> that that that's right. That hoary old story about um, about Paul Hamer from the Hamer Guitar mm. Company, who used to make your guitars. Um, um, when he told me that he got a call from Mark Knopfler saying, uh, you know, could you make me a guitar, please, Paul? And Paul said, sure, well, what kind of guitar are you looking for? What sort of sound do you want? And he said, well, I, I want to try and get that sound that Martin Barr from Jethro Tull gets. <laughs> and, and it was like, it was that very year that people were saying, oh, you know, Jethro Tull sounds like Dire Straits, you know, it's Dire Straits guitar sound. Whatever. So there you go. Silly old world. Silly old world, isn't yeah. it, Mart? Yeah. yeah. It's nothing that's original these days. Absolutely. Yeah. But it was a good album, and, and it, it, it was, I think, because Peter wasn't available to work with us that year, Sort of fell into place that it was just you, me, and Dave. Oh, that's right. I remember well, sitting here it kept and kept things kind of simple because with, with me writing the songs, whether on guitar mm -hmm. or keyboard, being the only keyboard player available, as it were. I mean, I, my technique is so limited. At least it kept the keyboard parts very simple and mm. put more emphasis again on the guitar stuff mm. and uh, you know vocals and flute, and it kind of gave it a you know a little bit of that sort of. Um, immediacy and that sort of human touch that had been missing perhaps in the in the previous couple of records and strange of course i mean this, this obviously is one of the album that i think and I, i'm i'm speaking here from almost certain you know deep inside personal knowledge this album almost certainly is for virtually all the members of metallica one of their personal mm -hmm. favorite albums because <laughs> it is of course the album that kept them from mm -hmm. winning a grammy in that particular year and of course it would have been much too early in their careers to win a grammy because you don't want to win a Grammy when you're just fresh out of, uh, you know, sort of rehearsal rooms. You're, it's much better off winning a Grammy second or third album into your, your life, and then you're kind of a little bit more established and not a one-hit wonder anymore. So I think we did them a mm, favor. I think so. It's a sign of maturity. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And there's no doubt about it that Metallica's music has matured a great deal over mm. the last three or four years since they didn't win that Grammy. <laughs> They've done really well. They have indeed. <laughs> and, uh, and, and indeed, their music has become far richer, far more... Uh, you know, musical, far more, you know, much deeper and more passionate affair than it ever was before. I think really as a result of, uh, you know, having been taught a little bit of a lesson by the old timers. That's my view. Well, I, I, I bought, I bought uh, the last Metallica album, mm. and uh, just because I was curious as to who they were and what they did, and uh, it struck me as owing a great deal to the, to Black Sabbath. It was a very sort of uh, doomy, kind of heavy, sort of monophonic, kind of uh, riff-laden piece. Um, I can see its attraction, but at the same time, <laughs> it seems a little short on humour. Unless mm. I'm missing something, Martin. Perhaps they're about to enter their hum humorous period. Perhaps they're going to wear concept fun albums That's and right. uh, perhaps, perhaps we can lend them our rabbit suits. Absolutely, those rabbit suits that haven't been used for all those years, Metallica mm. walking on stage in white rabbit yeah. suits, some of which have stuck zips. I going to say, <laughs> and they'll have to wash him house as well. There's one that John Evans had an accident in. Oh, you're absolutely right. <laughs> now, which one of Metallica do you think should wear John Evans' accident-prone yeah. oh, rabbit suit? Pot luck. <laughs> pot luck, perhaps, but plop luck, perhaps, and maybe you should just fill in your choice uh, on a postcard mm. and send it to this mailing address, <clears throat> which we will give you at the end of this program. 1987 was... What a year that was, Mark. What happened then? 
Oh, and I keep thinking we've, <laughs> we've come back on the same, yeah. Uh, that, there wasn't an album release on 87, but I think, were we touring then? And then Rock Island Well, we recorded, let me, let me, let towards let, the let, end let, of let's 87. Let's be fair about this. I think we recorded, in 1986, we began the recording process for, for Crest of the Nave. I think it was released in 87. Mm-hmm. And that takes us on to 1988, Martin. And indeed, mm. I think we've been talking gibberish for the last uh, mm. 10 minutes or so, but 1988 <laughs> was a year when not a lot it's happened. Not. We probably did actually win a Grammy in 1988, because yeah. that was probably the year we got the Grammy <laughs> for the album, which in fact was released in the year before, which was 1987. But you can see at our age all these things have become uh, very pedantic historical truths, most of which <clears> we choose <throat> to ignore in favour of the, the romanticised memory of, of more personal events. But no more about that broken oboe, Martin. Or that... Uh, <laughs> still broken. Pardon? It's still broken, in fact. It's yeah. still broken. Yeah. I you did take it out of its it case. Cracked. It had a crack, didn't it? It, was it had a crack. Night model. It wasn't yeah. really a wood one, was it? Um, it was a cheap one. And, uh, and I did take it out of its case and did blow a few notes and mm. immediately realised why it's been in its case for the last 15 years. This is another it's point. gone back in its another, case again. Another point worthy of examination. <laughs> I mean, for, for a person who spent most of his waking life being known as a, as a guitar, mm, uh, you know, a guitar player, <clears throat> and, and yet you seem to have this fascination with things that you put into your mouth um, with a view to, you know, achieving some great creative, if not procreative, mm. uh, end result. So, I mean, you, I've seen you play flute, mm -hmm. saxophone, oboe, you're mm. now admitting to, even though it had a crack in it, <laughs> and now you've brought a, 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 another saxophone. Mm. I mean, what, what is this fascination I, for wind instruments? I think it's people that come from Birmingham don't like to talk because they're... You know, their accents and the manner of speaking is so awful. Mm. I think it's a good excuse to shut up. And you've got a saxophone stuck in your mouth. People don't know you come from Birmingham. Well, that's I my can, theory. I can follow that logic, mm. but uh, I don't have another one. That's <laughs> the best one I've got. Well, in that case, Martin, I think with uh, 1987 not looking like a terrific. Uh, uh, year for Jethro Tull. Maybe we should just move on to 1988. Hi, it's Ian Anderson and Martin Barr. <laughs> I'm glad it's you, Martin. Goodness, who could well, have been have, talking yeah. to all these well, all these hours if it wasn't in fact you? Yes, it's us. And uh, we're talking about reminiscing on the 25 years of Jethro Tull. We're right up to the year uh, 1988, and 88 was a year, I think, marked by Jethro Tull's 20th anniversary, and uh, a year in which we salvaged all sorts of forgotten goodies and baddies from uh, the um, that sort of twilight studio period, some of which was in 1981, some of which went back to much earlier years. Radio um, appearances, TV appearances, live recordings, all sorts of things we put together as a boxed set, which um, was actually particularly interesting, I guess, for the, the real fans of Jethro Tull, since it had the kind of things on it that they had otherwise not had access to. And um, it was a, a good value for money piece. Mm. Still probably available <clears throat> if uh, if you happen to have an awful lot of money to spare. I think the, the worst thing on that album, uh, pardon me for saying it, is the tiny little photo that appears in the bottom right-hand corner, which was uh, the photo session that we did in the hay out in the countryside. Remember that? No. <laughs> trying to, we, I think you was try, trying to recreate the This Was album cover. Was it? And they <laughs> had us dressed up in beards. Dressed up in beards? Yeah, Not even our own? Uh, Gosh. It's a, yeah, no, I'll have a look at it. Well, actually, the cover, I thought, was a, was pretty pretty awful. That, for mm. me, the cover, the cover really was the worst thing about the 20 years mm. album. I thought it was a really, you know, yeah. garish, sort of awful. It kind of looked... Mm. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, upset anybody who follows any particular religion, um, but it had sort of certain um, Middle Eastern kind of overtones to it. Um, you know, it was a sort of a, I don't know, it just, it just looked garish. It looked, it looked bedecked. It was gold, and I hate things that are gold. You know, mm -hmm. it just, uh, ugh, I didn't like the album cover at all. 
Anyway, but it, but it was a good good the enough booklet. record. What? The booklet was good. The booklet was okay. I mean, yeah. it was informative and it, it, <clears> a lot of interesting stuff for people who are Jethro Tull fans and uh, one chance to buy that uh, block of material and, uh, um, of course, we'll be talking about the 25th anniversary albums in a few minutes and uh, that became even more of a problem trying to find out what we could do with the 25th anniversary one, but... No, it was a it, it was an okay year. We went out and did a 20th anniversary uh, tour. Uh, it took us around a lot of parts of the world. We played a lot of interesting places. 1989, we were back in the studio with an album which was called Rock Island, and uh, I, for me, another one of those a little short on the humour and warmth um, in relation to some other records. How do you feel about that? Yeah, Martin? strange enough, I feel the same way. Do you really? Yeah, yeah it was sort of. Sort of, but some. I mean, like the Waking Edge is a very. I mean, it's to me, it's a great song and it's well played and uh, an enjoyable one to record and listen to. But mm. it, but it is it's sort of a bit sombre and Rock Island as well. Mm, strange because it was actually but, on the crest of a naval. Was it really? I just, just a. Uh, uh, I was just testing you. Well, yeah, I was, well, yeah. I was testing you was, oh, at the so same I, time. I think it's on the yeah. crest of a naval. What do you is think? I agree with you. Yeah, come on. Look. I'm going to walk over there oh, no. tonight to, and, and pick up the record, which is probably in that sh shop. Yeah. I'll be back within a sec. And, and yet that was a cheerful album. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how, uh, as the years go on, the memory seems to decline. It's an interesting medical point. Well, yeah, it's the name. Well, yeah, yeah. It was close. I got the title oh, right. Was... I got the waking edge. At least I didn't say a waking edge. Martin, you were two years out. Uh, well, two years. Two years of your life has gone adrift. Yeah. What the hell was happening? And they're so precious how as long, well. How many years did it take to fix an oboe? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, it was a somber album. It was a somber album. Yes. I think we agreed on that. <laughs> we, agreed on that we can't point. agree what the hell we played on it, but we can agree on the sort of general nature of the thing. It was somber. Um, but it was okay. We, had, we did a couple of interesting tours, didn't we, with... Um, <laughs> With that big screen, you know that big yeah. screen we had yeah, back in the stage. Well, yeah. we're digging out the big screen again for the tours this <clears> year because <throat> it's a nice thing to project mm -hmm. images and uh, lights onto. And uh, and since it was very expensive, I'm determined <laughs> we're going to use it at least once more. Anyway, yeah, good old Rock Island. Got some good reviews, Rock Island, and the press over here. I seem to remember. <laughs> Jethro Tull in 1990. That was really a very much a year of touring, wasn't it, Martin? I think we were out doing all this, um, a lot of summer festivals in Europe, didn't we? We played in lots of interesting places. We went for the first time to uh, Turkey, to Estonia, to... Uh, we played Eastern, what was Eastern Germany? Eastern Germany, yeah, we played a whole bunch of places there, Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we gave us a little bit of time to do what... Well, I know I enjoy doing. I'm not sure how much everybody else enjoys it, but I, I really like to every year try and go and visit, you know, at least two or three new places that we haven't done before. And uh, 1990 was a good year for visiting a few new places. And uh, that's, for me, always a highlight, is going out and playing to people who've never seen you before. Mm -hmm. Especially because a lot of them, if they've heard <clears> of you before, and, you know, hopefully they have, then they have very high expectations. And what, what they don't realize, they, they think that a bunch of 20-year-olds is going to walk out onto the stage with fantastic bodies and a lot, and I mean a lot, of hair. <laughs> so the exciting thing is when you launch yourself out onto the stage in whatever it might be, whether it's Turkey or Mexico or, you know, this year, Venezuela, Chile, Uruguay, and all the... India and other places we go, um, you know, people have this very high expectation. They expect a miracle. Um, and in the first 20 seconds that you're out on stage, you know there is a wave of confusion tinged with disappointment <laughs> as they see a bunch of, you know, wrecked old mm. buggers like us. Sort of. and, and you know you've, really, you've got a very, very limited amount of time to win them over. Mm -hmm. You really have to nail it in that first song. You've got to say, hey, you know, okay, we're in our 40s. We are menopausal. But we're, <clears throat> if, well, at least we're going to give you, you know, 90% of what you expect. And the bit that there's a missing 10%, by the end of the show, 
is going to be plus 10 percent not minus 10 percent and that that's that's the challenge that i really enjoy about doing those places because you you know you really have to go out there and, and, and you, you're not just it's not as if you're just competing in the way that you were when you first started as a brand new band that no one had ever heard of you haven't just got to win people over from that <clears> point of view you've actually got to do more than that you've got to mm -hmm. overcome your own reputation in the sense of, of people expecting a certain thing and a lot of it and you've actually got to go out and do better than that in the sense of not leaving people disappointed and miracle upon miracles we do thankfully manage to um, engender if one believes the reviews which uh, to an extent you have to um, you know that we seem to do okay I mean we get we get our at least our fair share of uh, fairly complimentary mm -hmm reviews first time around in some of these new strange countries they they seem to be ultimately not disappointed and think that we're uh, we're very very brave as well as being very very old i think it, but we must be one of the few groups that don't have a photograph of us on album covers this is a, this is the whole problem isn't it they don't know what we look like <laughs> yeah but that, that's why we did that first one you see that where this was where we oh, did actually look like old men yeah. so that we were thinking ahead there to try and yeah. condition the audience that uh, mm. they wouldn't be too disappointed when we could <clears> actually <throat> look that old mm -hmm. unfortunately <laughs> we did actually look that old about <laughs> about eight years ago Martin we're now like, really on seriously borrowed time mm. however uh, there's only one thing for it find somewhere else where they haven't seen us play yet <laughs> well that's one solution the other solution is to learn all of status quo's back catalogue uh. Yeah. And get out there and do it. It's the um, pose well, that what gets me. Kimbo. It's, it's the, the pose. Yeah, yeah the legs, tight the legs jeans. apart bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, the tight jeans we can probably do. S stretching exercises. Mm. It's mm. just the uh, it's the little finger <clears> bit <throat> for the dun da dun da dun da dun. You really mm. got to stretch that little finger as well as the jeans. It's the. Uh, but that they are amazingly committed to what they do, aren't they? Oh, they they do it very well. I mean, I, I, miming TV. I mean that they. 100% commitment isn't Le it? A lesson to us, yeah, we, we mm. did a did a TV show in Germany not too many months ago where everybody in this mammoth TV show was actually miming to their their hits or hit in most cases and status quo were on it and I mean we, we hate mime, we're terrible at it, we go out there and we, we sort of just squirm and we're so embarrassed you know we really would just rather play live or not at all but we were we had to mime or just into the show so we mined, the next best thing was to mine to a live recording, which we'd actually recorded specially in Canada a few days before. But status quo went up there and mined to one of their sort of things, and I mean, they they were completely convincing, weren't they? I mean, they really yeah. they really make it look like they're playing live. Mm, I love it. On the one hand, that's very show busy, mm. but on the other hand, it shows a kind of commitment and a professionalism that basically, um, you know, something I don't think we have. And I, I hope that we've learned that lesson, lesson Martin. Next time, <laughs> next time out, I, I'm expecting yeah. you to really just, you know, try harder. <laughs> could try harder. <laughs> it's going to say, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, got a hand to status quo. They, they give it a lot of, a uh, lot of effort. I actually caught one of them uh, when we played a, a show in, I think it was in Germany with them, and we were on that no, no, insane. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. The double decker bus. No, no, you're still wrong. Am I? Yeah, they, they played with us, Martin. I do beg your yeah. pardon that they played with us. They were a support band. Uh, you're day, yeah. entirely correct. Very nice chaps. And um, but we didn't let them come in our big bus. No. <laughs> we didn't indeed. Yeah. And one of them was actually practicing practicing his apart. stance. I saw that outside behind the, the bus changing room, before yeah. he went on. Oh, that's it was amazing. I applaud. Yeah. I saw that, that sort too. of devotion. And his guitar wasn't even plugged in. <laughs> It was fantastic, yeah. 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 But that's true. I mean, at least you know, again, mm -hmm. taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. I was asked today by a photographer who was photographing us. Um, you know, can you uh, do the uh, um, you know the bit where you uh, well uh, you know where you uh, uh, stand on the one leg? You know, and this is in my dining room at home. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just how can you do that stuff? It's just so <laughs> embarrassing. I'm trying to explain. The only reason I ever did stand on one leg was you know that people. I must have done it once accidentally and then somebody wrote about it in the newspaper and then I was expected to do it for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And I only do it as a joke. It's a bit of a sort of, you know, come on guys, here's the, that silly sort <clears> of <throat> look, get your photograph taken and, and leave so the audience can get a yeah. good view. Um, it's very embarrassing. Mm -hmm. I could certainly ask not practice you, that. People sort of ask you how long you've been training in ballet. Yeah, that's a, they do ask that a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, they used to ask that a lot. In fact, some of them still do. You know, did you study ballet? Did you do this? Mm. Did you that? I say, hey, you can ask Martin Barr how long he studied saxophone. Mm. Point taken. At which point they usually leave. <laughs> 1991, we were back in the studio again, back in Dave Pegg's uh, studio, where he and the Fairport Convention Boys usually record, and we did some uh, some rehearsals um, leading to the the album that again became known as Catfish Rising. It's funny how we quite often have had albums that didn't have titles until the very, very last minute. Catfish Rising, mm -hmm. like Christopher Nave, was one of those, had the artwork, I think, before we actually got the title to the album. And... Uh, Maybe because of maybe because of the fact that a lot of the songs were written on mandolins and acoustic guitars, it kind of set a tone for the album, which was on the one hand had an acoustic kind of element to it, but at the same time it then sort of took on some other kind of rock side of it as well, but much more of a guitar type of album. Yeah, it? it was uh, the album where I broke my thumb halfway through. Oh, that's right. Mm. What were you doing? Uh, well, I, I was skiing and I fell over, and uh, it was very embarrassing. So it was sort of a five-week period when I wasn't around, and then when I came back, it was uh, I had to learn how to play again. Mm. I always do things like that. I, I usually cut my finger, done that one as well, sort of s sliced my finger mm. during an album. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. it's a dangerous sports, Martin. It is, yeah. You've got to watch out yeah. for that. But uh, we did uh, we did have a few keyboard players in, didn't we, on that album? We had uh, John Bundrick, who used to be with um, the Free Guys. Yeah. Free and then Bad Company, was it? Uh, he played uh, a couple of tracks. In fact, he's <clears> on a couple of the unreleased studio tracks from that period, which will be oh, coming out soon oh, yeah. on Jethro yeah. Tull's other box set later this year. Um mm. And then we had, uh, who was that guy who played on uh, White Innocence? Um, uh, now then, Martin, testing your memory as well as my own. It'll come back to us. It'll come back to us. Very nice chap. Scottish guy. Remember? In your studio. Ah, uh, yes, then. indeed. The name is completely good. A very he famous was. keyboard player, Martin. Now, let me tell you. Let, yes, let me be really pleased. We can't remember his name. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be very difficult to remember. I can... The face, no I can problem. Remember his face. I can remember yeah. his accent. I can remember very his car. Nice. I can remember his yeah. car. And he came down very and played nice. very well. He did. Such a good player. In fact, his name is a complete mystery. Gosh, you would be so angry. Yeah, he will. And he's a very... Yeah. But he was, he was one of those guys that was known. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a name like Foss Patterson, who could forget you? Yeah. I can't remember his name, though. Yeah. <laughs> it was something like Foss Patterson. Yeah. yeah. Wasn't it Foss could Patterson? It, it Foss I think Patterson? it was actually Foss, yeah. It was mm. indeed. Very good player. Yeah. Friend of Peter Vitesse's. Yeah. And, uh, and then towards the end of those sessions, in walked... Uh, a rather strange guy with one ear that sticks out and a rather peculiar hairstyle which involves well a kind of strange <laughs> look of which we were, we, we, we were referring privately and quietly over lunch martin today andy giddings is um of some uh, more recent vintage than the rest of us but has <coughs> still managed to play with people like eric burden who's even older than us and uh, certainly uglier than us and um and who's a little chappy that used to dress up in a clown Leo suit? Sayer. Leo Sayer. Leo Sayer, yes, he played with Leo mm. Sayer on tour and, and, mm. and what have you. And he came along to us and we found in him, I suppose, a kind of keyboard player that, whilst understanding all the, the nuances and aspects of uh, modern technology, still had a, <clears throat> a convincing pianistic technique that would allow him to you know, be sounding good, whether it was on Hammond organ or a piano, or indeed dealing with all the fancy mm. sort of gadgets that keyboard players have to uh, acquaint themselves with today. And Andy's a pretty good guy, and yep. uh, I know he's been working with you on your mm -hmm. recent uh, uh, solo album work, which you're in the process of completing. Mm -hmm. He has and indeed, um, he's been working with me on some new demos for things that, uh, in fact, you have on the little tape that I handed you this Very morning nice. to go and listen yes. to. Yes, so we have mm -hmm. some... Andy's busy at work with Jethro <clears throat> Tull and Martin Barr, Andy and Anderson on all sorts of things. Is our uh, is our favourite keyboard player at the moment. 
Isn't it strange, though, that the sort of acid test for a keyboard player is that they have to play the nice guy. well and a sense of humour mm. and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, he could play the introduction to locomotive breath. That's very I mean, true. There's so many that just couldn't play it. That's very true. And in fact, Randy and I were just, just trying to work out a, a shortened version of that for a TV mm. show that we have to do. And uh, and in doing so, he had to sit and play that introduction. And I, I actually said, wait a minute, and that's really very close. But there was something that John Evans did play back in 1971, mm. which was just a really magic bit. And we went back and listened to the original recording of mm -hmm. it. And, uh, I mean, Andy <coughs> had the whole thing within a, a couple of minutes. He yeah. really had the not just playing the right notes, but playing it with that sort of John Evans feel. And that's just such a great thing, not just for us, but for the audience, because when they hear that very conspicuous piano intro, they really want to hear it the way that it was originally. They don't want to hear somebody coming in and doing their sort of interpretation of it, because it's become a sort of classic piano intro. Mm. It's that t terrible um, habit that keyboard players have of making every chord a, a fourth or a ninth. Yes, they, well, it, particularly so ninths. They do love really ninths annoying, for some reason. <laughs> the ninth, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a particularly obscene, uh, complicated chord, but uh, I kind of know what it is when I play it, uh, but I, I don't actually understand quite what they are. But they're, they're sort of, they're interesting when you use them on purpose, you know, once every three or four albums, but when it's every second chord, then uh, it almost certainly <coughs> leads to your instant dismissal <coughs> from Jethro Tull as a keyboard player. <laughs> so, Andy, if, you're, if you happen to be out there listening to or reading this, then uh, I should just, um, you know, take really serious note of that. And, and by the way, try and stick that other ear down. 1992, Martin, saw us out there doing a really weird thing, didn't we? We went off to do oh, yeah. a secondary market <coughs> European tour. It mm -hmm. meant that we went off to play places like Spain mm -hmm. and uh, and some Italian gigs and, and places we hadn't really been to for a while, sort of kind of more far-flung places. And we went off with Andy Giddings uh, playing keyboards and Dave Mattox, who joined us uh, mm -hmm. uh, for mm -hmm. 1992 uh, in the... Uh, the capacity of playing uh, slightly simpler, more direct kind of drums since we anticipated our uh, pseudo-acoustic tours later in that year, uh, while Dome was off playing with, where was he, oh, he was playing with John Anderson and people yeah, like that doing, and doing his writing and <coughs> stuff, so, so mm -hmm. we had a, Dave Mattox came, came in for a little while there, and uh, we had, I, I enjoyed that European tour, do you remember yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 funnily enough, it was, it was very nerve-wracking playing the more acoustic songs and also playing a lot quieter and simpler it was actually a different approach it was quite i was quite nervous the first few dates we did mm. but it, yeah, it was really satisfying to I do think, i think the most scary thing wasn't <clears throat> actually the the change to the music because it wasn't really that it was an acoustic tour i mean it, it was kind of just a little bit more emphasis on songs that we had recorded most of which were kind of more acoustic anyway um, but it still had its sort of loud and up-tempo uh, moments as well. But it was actually the size of the venues I found really very terrifying. It was mm -hmm. to go back and play in... I, mean, I remember one theatre we played in, in um, whether it was Berlin or Munich. I mean, it was about 1,100 people or something, mm -hmm. and it was just scary. I mean, you could almost reach out and touch the back row. It was, mm -hmm. And I found that absolutely, I mean, really, really frightening to feel... Everybody in the room could really see every and hear everything you did. It was yeah. it was a strange, strange thing to get used to. But mm. after the first couple of songs, it was really enjoyable. You know, you felt the sort of intimacy mm. that you really were contacting <clears throat> all the audiences. Once once you got used to the idea, it was great. But it was mm. very frightening walking on stage. Well, it's n normal to, to just see the first few rows of an audience, and then the the rest is sort of in in the darkness, mm. hidden. But to actually be able to see every one of the audiences. Uh, it's actually, it, it is really nice that, that they wouldn't appreciate the difference, yeah. or maybe they do, but it is actually nice to read the expression on That's the right. whole audience faces. But, but, I mean, to play to, I mean, let's take it one extreme, if you're playing to many millions of people on some live TV <laughs> thing, um, it's, it doesn't feel really substantially different to playing to, you know, 150,000 or 200,000 people in some big outdoor thing. Um... And it doesn't feel so different to playing to 50,000 or 20,000 or 10,000 people. 
it's really only when you get down to the numbers like less than 2,000, suddenly things start to become really intimate. Mm -hmm. And then it gets, uh, th that's when it really takes on this very interesting kind of uh, level of, you know, almost like having people in your own home to play to, you know, when, it, when it's those kind of, you know, 1,000 to 2,000 people. I, I find that really, really interesting. I wish there was mm -hmm. some way that we could do that, you know, more often without the necessity of playing you know, in, in obviously lots of places at any rate, in terms of having to play two or three or four or five nights somewhere, which, um, again, for me is pretty weird. I, I like to leave town the next morning after one show. I'm not a, I'm not a stayer. Mm, no, I, I'm, I agree. I, it's, it's, not the, it's, not, it's not the stage, it's the, the dressing rooms and the, the hotel and everything that goes with doing more than one show in any town. I like to move mm. on. Yep. How about you, Martin? Well, you I'm probably a, have no, to move on no for reasons math. that we can't go into right here. Oh, well, it's true, yeah. yeah. But, legal uh, reasons. Well, legal reasons and reasons <laughs> to do with... Um, I mean, there's actually quite a few people, actually, after your... Um, <laughs> They're not, not clarinet. Was it? Oh, yeah. no, sorry, Oboe. <laughs> Is it the same Italians that we met in New York when first we moved? Yeah, it's the, guy, it's, the, it's the guys in the restaurant that you didn't pay for that ah. roast beef sandwich, yeah. Hey, believe that. Now that roast beef sandwich is really going to come back to haunt you, yeah, yeah. especially as a vegetarian. <laughs> well, after 1992's A Little Light Music Tour and its counterpart, uh, the Light and Dark Tour in the USA and Canada later in the year, we move on to 1993, which so far I've seen you, Martin Barr, working on a solo project, me feverishly fighting against dwindling time to get the uh, the two CD Jethro Tull Best Of Remastered Greatest Hits package together and also the four CD 25th Anniversary album and now working even as we speak on Jethro Tull's other box set for release later this year um, and we're about to head off now into the uh, into the uh, exciting new territories of new South American countries and Southeast Asia and as well as visiting our uh, dear friends in uh, the UK, most of the European mainland countries, North America, Canada, and um, it's going to be a little busy year for us, isn't it, mm -hmm. 1993? Yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, from the end of May almost through to Christmas. Yeah, and then after and that, uh, in 1994, if we mm -hmm. may be so bold to jump ahead that far, mm -hmm. it takes us off again to uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and some other Southeast Asian ports yeah. of call. Good. But I, I'm jumping on an aeroplane next week to head off to uh, Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, and <coughs> Tokyo, doing promo stuff. And then I come back for one night and head off somewhere else. I have to go to Brazil... Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Venezuela, Mexico, and then I shall meet you in New York City, mm -hmm. where we have to do a quick rehearsal yeah. for a radio broadcast, and then we have to do uh, a show in Philadelphia, I think, and then we head off to do the Tonight Show. All of this may be historical, of course, for you people now reading about this or listening to it, but that's what we were up to, and then... Uh, then I'm off around Europe doing promo, and then uh, and then we start the tour, which is uh, probably more, I would think, more concerts during the next 12-month period than probably we have played since the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's kind of stepping up the profile a little mm -hmm. bit in this, uh, in this 25th year with all this... Uh, um, regurgitation of uh, old music as well as the, the new music as well as new arrangements of old music and uh, the pundits might say old arrangements of some new music mm -hmm. too since uh, we have like it or not a certain style I mean I don't think we can ever go back and uh, wipe out all those years gone by and come up with something that sounds totally unlike Jethro Tull, we're kind of stuck with that strange thing that we do. That we don't know. And we don't, we know, don't know why or how, but yeah. everybody else says it's there. That's right, everybody says, oh yeah, sounds like Jethro <laughs> Tull. Oh yeah, that must be strange, Martin Barr. We'd recognise mm -hmm. his oboe anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
isn't it isn't it irritating I, when i when i get when i get a laugh out of one thing i plug it mercilessly mm. until it's well, really, it's... really 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 <laughs> annoying and you god it's, I, I hate that about me i know i'm doing it you know i wish i didn't do it yeah, well uh, the, the most difficult thing for me this year is is not oboe but i've got to try and sing because of course yes. you have to sing on the indeed i do mm. but then that's it will be, be all right. Purgatory. Well, it'll be purgatory if there's anybody and else listening. And then very humorous. My, 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 <laughs> but my, for anybody listening. <laughs> my, <laughs> that's not what I meant. <laughs> no, I meant it was going to be purgatory for you if anybody oh, else is listening I mean, while you're singing oh, for yes, the first yes, time in the studio. Well, not yes. quite the first time, yeah. but nearly. My advice would be mm. ask your engineer. Well, he yeah. won't be there. Give, give him a couple of pounds and send him off mm -hmm. to the uh, to the curry restaurant or something yeah. for takeaway and then try and get the vocals done while he's not in the room. Because mm. it's much easier if <clears> there's nobody listening. But anyway, I have heard you sing before because you did actually, some years ago, I, I did. I remember did, that. Did, did uh, mm -hmm. hear a demo that you did for a song that you wrote, and I mean the singing mm -hmm. was. I think I said to you then. Well, you know, you, you, there's nothing to stop it, you it? doing it. You can do it. It's. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, oh. I mean, put it this way, Marge. I mean, your voice is probably almost virginal. I mean, hardly That's being, true, hardly yes, being used virgin. at all in yeah. all of your 48 years. Yeah. Perhaps that could be the you album let that title. By 48 years, I said. Did you? Am I 48? No, not quite. I You're can't 40, even remember. You're 46 or something, aren't you? But I thought I'd I probably try you on, so you well, can, not listen. Well, old, old, really. Old, 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 old. Yeah. Anyway, but in all your 40-whatever years, mm. I mean, that voice has hardly ever had to mm. you know, strain itself above a whisper and a cheese yeah. sandwich. And shouting at the kids. Yeah, and consequently, if you can learn to sing Aqualung, Locomotive Breath, Thick as a Brick, and a few other goodies mm. like that, I think we could come to some kind mm. of a deal. <laughs> Well, this is Ian Anderson and Martin Barr from Jess Hotel, and you've been listening to us reminisce, not entirely convincingly, about what seems like a hundred years, but was actually only 25 of Jess Hotel's most recent history. And uh, it's been good to have you with us, and I don't think we're going to muster another 25, do you, Martin? Uh, a nice thought, but as, as many as we can. Yeah, we'll keep a few going. more. 25 yeah. would another 25 is stretching it mm -hmm. i think come come year come year sort of 28 29 i think we could find ourselves not quite being out there for the concert of your choice we might have to stay home and wash our hair mm. so, so, <laughs> plural plural let's be or brave moustache. plural or moustache if that's all that's left so a few years from now we may still be with you we may not but if I'm at home with Martin, helping to wash his moustache, then it's been great knowing you. And it's been great talking to you now. And uh, enjoy these little goodies we have for you this year. I think we can promise you a few more years before Martin Barr, Ian Anderson, Dave Pegg, Don Perry, and Andy Giddings finally hang up whatever it is musicians hang up and uh, head out to that great uh, playing field in the sky where we do nothing but uh, exotic sports with uh, small mammals and attractive air stewardesses from very famous international airlines, particularly Singapore, um, and uh, live out those, uh, those twilight years in carefree abandon. I may even take up instrumental repairs, Martin. I, think <laughs> I, I could end my That's years idea, being having yeah. a little corner shop yeah, be very good. where you bring in mm. some savagely broken down instrument that you know has really let mm. you down. Can't think of one that needs repairing off hand. Well, Martin, I'm glad you mentioned <laughs> that because I think yeah. I could end my life fixing up your oboe. Gosh. What are you going to do for me? Yeah, I'd, well, I'd, I'd have nothing left. Once my oboe goes, that's it. <laughs> They're going to be wondering what this hobo business is all about. Yeah. In fact, it's incredibly literal. I'll leave you with this thought. Martin actually did have a real hobo, and it broke. And he had to go all the way from... Uh, Japan, Tokyo? Japan, yes, yeah. and you had to fly back to New York mm. the long way around in order to get your hobo repaired. And that's... Dedication. Old, that was dedication. Mm -hmm. A very expensive kind of <laughs> repair, as I recall. <laughs> Anyway, that's about it. Great to talk to you. See you again. Bye-bye from me, Ian Anderson, Jethro Tull. And goodbye from me, Martin Barr. Talk to you again soon. Real soon, you hear? <laughs>